did you know that the PC Engine had the largest shooting library in the history of gaming consoles? Over a hundred in total. So many that every list I find online is still incomplete. And in this epic video, you're gonna see me review every single one of them, highlighting each game with a short review and then ranking it in a tier list on how it compares to the rest of the library. Every format, Hue card, CD, Super CD, Arcade card, Super Graphics, even competition only Hue cards, all here. You're going to see real hardware along with the physical games as I wanted to create a visual record every single PC Engine shooter in existence. You'll even see hidden games within other games that never had their own release, as well as some homebrew indie games. It's all here, baby. So without further ado, because we've got a lot of games to cover, the most awesome, massive shooting library in the history of gaming, every single PC Engine shooter. Starting off strong with 1941 Counter-Attack for the Super Graphics, port of Capcom's arcade game and in my opinion, the best of the 1940s series of games. Departing from the conservative previous games, the designs are now exaggerated with futuristic and massive bosses, along with more whimsical gameplay, like the spin mechanic that lets you spray shots in all directions while bouncing off the walls, or the shadow power-up that creates duplicates of your plane. It's just a truly fun game that looks and sounds great. The super graphics port is well done, with most of the graphical effects intact, along with a toned down difficulty versus the arcade. If you're one of the few who own a Super Graphics, this one is a must own. 1941 is an A tier game. Play it. Nineteen forty three Kai, another nineteen forties shooter by Capcom, ported from the arcade by Naxitsoft. Only this version is more than meets the eye. In fact, it's quite special and holds a secret for the more dedicated players. The first part of the game is a pretty faithful port of the original, and a very long game at that, until you finish what would normally be the final stage in the arcade. That's when this PC Engine port goes off the rails and is taken to a new level. Instead of being tied down by the original and ending it there, they got creative. Suddenly your plane gets upgraded in both speed and weaponry, and the rest of the game gets upgraded as well. Graphics are given a boost with a lot more going on in the background and multiple layers of scrolling. Your ship and enemies are souped up. It looks and plays like a different game. So cool in fact that it makes you wish the entire game was this way. And it's the late game that makes it shine, raising it from average into very good. 's keep on coming with our first alphabetical game the awesome aero blasters anyone who knows the PC engine or turbo knows this game another great arcade port from Hudson originally developed by Canico most notable for its outstanding chip tunes and brutal difficulty it's one of the hardest games on the system and that's saying something it's also known for its rage inducing space physics on stage four and five where the game decides it wasn't already hard enough and makes your ship move with inertia. Oh, and have fun trying to collect all these power-ups that simply explode and drop all over the screen. It's like the developers just wanted to piss you off with unusual gimmicks not seen before, but then make a game that's so cool otherwise, you just want to keep playing it anyway. I did a whole video comparing both this version to the Mega Drive port, along with the arcade, but suffice to say, despite its difficulty, it's just so much fun I kept coming back to it as a kid. The music is a real strong point with some of the best chip tunes on the system. 
Mechanical made some great shooters, and this was one of their best. You can play it two players on the PC Engine version as well. Not that it made it any easier. Aero Blasters isn't perfect, but it is exceptional and an A-tier game in the library. What do you get when an NEC port of a Sega Classic is better than the Mega Drive port of its own Classic on its own console? You get Afterburner 2 on the PC Engine. Not that it's anywhere near arcade perfect, of course. No home console at the time could even come close in terms of scaling and graphics. But given the limitations, this port was impressive. The ground detail is far more sparse, but overall, the game is okay to look at. That's aside from that poor Canyon bonus level, which looks like absolute crap. Not sure what happened there. But they even implemented some nice faux scaling on the refueling section. And the menu even has a 3D mode, where you can play around with and manipulate the logo. The chiptunes also sound good and are well converted. But the crown jewel here is the gameplay, which blows the rest away. It's super fast, runs at 60 frames, and is an absolute joy to control. To the point where it's hard to go back and even play the Mega Drive port afterwards. I was personally never a big fan of the game at home, as nothing really compares to that amazing Sega arcade cabinet. And when you remove that aspect, it's not nearly as compelling. There's plenty of arcade perfect ways to play Afterburner now, making this older port more of a curiosity. But as an early port on a basic Hue card, they exceeded expectations and made something quite impressive for its time that, most importantly, plays like a dream. Man, how many great shooters does the PC Engine have? We just started this list, and it's already banger after banger, with the famous Air Zonk being one of the best on the console. Take PC Genjin, or Bonk as we know him in the US, and put him in his own shooter with large, gorgeous sprites, extremely creative levels from start to finish, and one of the best Hue Card soundtracks on the console. Many cite it as one of their favorites, and I definitely agree. It's top tier in almost every respect. One of its standout features is the sheer variety of weapons, upgrades, transformations, and almost a dozen different helpers that can fight along with you. And if you can keep your friends around long enough, you can merge with each one of them. Like becoming a milk-spewing cow. Or at least I hope it's a cow and not a bull. Cause then, uh, I don't wanna know what those bottles are filled with. Be that as it may, Air Zonk is one of the coolest, most creative, and fun shooters on the system, with a humor and style not matched by any other STG of its generation. Air Zonk is synonymous with exclusive PC Engine shooters, and a top S-tier game in the library. Yeah, I know, it's not alphabetical, but it makes sense to put these two together. Hot on the heels of the incredibly successful Air Zonk came the sequel known as Super Air Zonk Rockabilly Paradise, or CD Dungeon in Japan. Because yes, the second game was on Super CD, and you'd expect it to be as awesome as the original or more so, but alas, it wasn't meant to be. Mainly as it wasn't developed by Red Company that made the first game. It's still an above average shooter with more really colorful and creative levels, and a good CD soundtrack, though not on the level of the wonderful chiptunes of the original game. There's less weapon variety, and you can't experiment with the large roster of companions as you could in the first. The stages are a bit more terrain focused and slower paced than the first game. And even though it still looks nice and colorful, it's lost levels of parallax scrolling the original game had. Just a step backwards in every respect while still being a good game. But you'd expect a lot more jumping from Hue Card to Super CD. What a difference a developer makes. Air Zonk was phenomenal, so the sequel had a lot to live up to and simply didn't. More of the same, only not as good would be how I'd describe it. It lacks the energy that made the original such a blast, and for me, is barely above average. A 
another super graphics shooter. Aldines was a showcase for what the system could do graphically. Like how many layers of parallax can we throw into a single background? Why so many that you'll lose count? How about some huge enemy sprites to show off all that extra super graphics RAM? But Aldines isn't a one-trick pony. It also has some really great chip tunes. But aside from the visuals and the music, it also happens to be one of the better shooters on the system. With gameplay that may not be super innovative, but is on the money in terms of gameplay and challenge. Plain and simple, Aldines is just a well-made game all around and highly underrated. Not surprising being an exclusive super graphics game with no other way to play it. But do yourself a favor, if you're a fan of PC Engine shooters and haven't played it before, give it a shot and you may be surprised by how good it is. This ranking was a hard choice, as it's not quite A tier, but better than other B tier games on this list. A B plus if there ever was one. Aldines was a must own for those with a super graphics. Alza Dick is the first caravan shooter in this list, part of Naxitsoft's Summer Carnival series in 92. Contests held live in Japan to see who would come out with the highest scores. And as such, it's not a full game, but just a set of score attack stages made for the competition. It's not a bad game either, though it's somewhat outshined by so many other good caravan shooters that you'll see later in this list. The best thing about Alza Dick is the music, which is outstanding, while the worst thing is the unfortunate name. The gameplay is somewhere in between and worth checking out if you've played the other caravans and are looking for a new one to try. But it's my least favorite of the caravan shooters. The gameplay is on point and it controls well, and the scoring has a lot of depth, as it should being a dedicated competition game. And if it were a complete game of this quality, it'd be in the B tier for me. But ranked against the other amazing caravan shooters on the system and their incredibly fun score attack modes. All Zadik is on the average side, for me overall. Armed Formation F, developed by Michibitsu, the same developer behind the more popular Moon and Terra Cresta games. In fact, it shares some minor attributes like the ability to change the formation of your options as well as firing them out like a weapon. The most striking thing about Armed F are the really unique, gory visuals on many of the stages with so much pulsating, glowing, and undulating around you, along with cool creature designs and enemy bosses. The artwork in the game makes a strong impression, or at least it did in the arcade. Unfortunately, the PC Engine port is very basic by comparison, and doesn't come close to capturing what makes the arcade artwork so cool, making for a pretty bland experience by comparison, both visually and orally. It's still a decent shooter, not bad, but if you're going to play this one and can emulate, I recommend enjoying the arcade version and that visual style it has to offer. As unlike many other really well-made PC Engine ports, Armed F doesn't measure up. Atlantean, the first indie game on this list, released late in 2014 by Aetherbyte, and was the first actual Hue card game released in decades after the PC Engine ended its run. A Defender-style game under the sea with some fast-paced gameplay, and a few stages to progress through with parallax scrolling and some fun chiptunes, and all running on real hardware. Nothing overly complex to write about, but a solid homebrew keeping the PC Engine scene alive. It's sure a whole lot better than another underwater shooter called Deep Blue, which we'll unfortunately review later in the video. I'm not going to tier the homebrew games, as I think it's great that indie devs are making them at all, and I'm always looking forward to see what the next one will bring.
Atomic RoboKid, or Special, on the PC Engine version. UPL was known for making games with some pretty huge character sprites, and this one is no exception. What makes the PC Engine version special is that it's not a straight port, but actually a remix with different backgrounds for the stages, as well as an added energy bar, making the game, for better or worse, a good bit easier versus the much more brutal original arcade, which had one-hit kills. The original game is quite hard, bordering on frustrating due to the large hitbox and easy death. So while not arcade accurate, I personally find it the most accessible and fun to actually play. How much you enjoy RoboKid will depend on what you're looking for, as it plays nothing like a traditional shooter, but much more methodical and calculated, with exploration, hidden secrets, and freedom of movement. For many, it just doesn't come together into a fun game they want to replay, while others really enjoy it. But just the fact it's so unique, with a lot of stages to play through, good catchy music, and is like almost nothing else out there, you certainly can't call it average and earning itself a B rank in this list. Avenger is one of the less interesting and very average shooters on the PC Engine. It's actually one of the very first early CD games, so I cut it a bit of slack. It does have some unique mechanics, like firing diagonally depending on the direction you're facing, similar to the classic Gyrodyne, except it does give you a button to lock your direction of fire, and the music is catchy with the Red Book audio, but the effects are often way too loud and often ruin your ability to enjoy it. You gain more weapon options as you progress through the game, and it is more fun to play than its pedestrian presentation would have you believe. Just don't go in expecting anything but an average shooter, and you may find some fun to be had. The base gameplay is fine, and nothing about it is broken like so many other truly poor games. There are far worse shooters out there, with this one just not being particularly memorable, and really not even average, but below. but tries to be original and has some interesting concepts and design, but ends up being on the very slow and cumbersome side in its execution. Its control scheme is similar to games like Forgotten Worlds, where you rotate your gun to fire in any direction 360 degrees around you. Unfortunately, that control scheme has always been cumbersome on consoles, using a pad, and it's not any different here. The stages can be a bit slow, with a lethargic scrolling speed and stretches of not much happening, but also not an easy game to necessarily finish because of the one single life that it gives you, which means replaying it can become a chore. The stages vary between interesting and uninspired, and while the chiptunes are decent, the constant sound of your gun chirping away can get annoying. As another very early hue card release, I'm willing to cut it some slack, because it does get more interesting as you progress farther into the game, but simply getting there through the initial slow stages is a slog. Not memorable to me personally with so many other amazing shooters available on the console. Not a game I really come back to to replay, and average at best. Blazing Lasers, a nostalgic intro for a bona fide classic, and a game that needs no introduction. Originally titled Gunhead on the PC Engine, Compile's first game for the console to show what they can do with the hardware, and absolutely knocked it out of the park, making it the must-own game. The shooter that turned myself and many others into fans of the genre, 
looking for more games just like it to play. The graphics were a step above anything we had seen on previous gen consoles, and the music and sound effects were next level, with a mid-range and bass that still sounds impressive today. Perfect for beginners with the first two stages being easy and slower. Almost too much so for those coming back to it over and over. Giving the game a bit of a slow start, but eventually turning into a fast paced, properly challenging game to master in its second half. It had all kinds of secrets to find, making finishing the game for novices easier. Compared against the games that followed, like the Soldier series, it does have its shortcomings and isn't perfect. But as one of the very early shooting games on the console, and compared to all other shooters of the time, the level of quality and creativity was unmatched. It captured our imagination, coming from the previous generation, in a way that few other shooters have since. Leave it to Compile to push the hardware and create an early game with zero slowdown, and one of the most memorable experiences on the system. When you are the blockbuster prototype that so many other games copied and improved upon, perfect or not, that makes you a classic and an S-tier game in the library. Burning Angels isn't spectacular, but it's fast-paced, fun, and with some fan service along the way to keep you entertained between stages. You choose between two of the heroines in either the Dragon or Phoenix ship, and head out to rescue the third angel of your trio that's been kidnapped. Burning in the title refers to the most interesting mechanic. Once you've maxed your burning bar, your ships can merge and unleash a powerful attack, either a laser or invincibility, turning the ship into a flaming phoenix. So managing your burning bar and having the move at the ready is a key part of the strategy. The graphics are solid for a Hucard game, with some effects and parallax here and there, but most of the backgrounds are pretty static and generic. It's also hit and miss with the music, some being quite catchy, while others not that memorable. So overall, Burning Angels is what I consider one of the average shooters on the PC Engine, but one I happen to like simply for the high speed of the gameplay. These types of unique and exclusive games are a part of what I enjoy most about the PC Engine Shooter Library, and Burning Angels is unique enough to be worth checking out. You can't talk about weird shooters without talking about Choaniki, and this series is about as weird as it gets. Funny, wacky, and occasionally homoerotic, in a goofy, whimsical way. Every game in the series will have you wondering what exactly you're going to see next. In terms of gameplay, this original Choaniki is the most traditional, where you play as either the caped Idaten or blue-haired Benton along with what would eventually become the series staples, your bodybuilder buds, Adon and Samson. In the first game, they act as options, augmenting your firepower, and the gameplay is actually very straightforward and traditional, especially compared to the later games. It's the rest of the game that's not even close to normal. Being on the Super CD format, it has some of the most interesting stages, enemies, and especially the bosses of anything on the PC Engine, and that's saying something and the music is perfect for the game, with an operatic Pink Floyd-like sound that just wouldn't work for anything else. The shooting mechanics are solid, but nothing to really write home about. It's the style, atmosphere, music, and outright absurdity that I can't get enough of. It's not just a unique and fun game, but in my mind, it's also a work of art in both enemy and boss design. One of my favorite games on the PC Engine to come back to and replay for its visuals and atmosphere alone. Aicho Aniki. 
the sequel makes no bones about trying something completely new. If the first game was traditional, this one is anything but. And yeah, there will be a lot of butts on display here. But the biggest difference is you now play as a Don or Samson from the first game, not as options but as the main character. The controls are fighting game style with your character massive on the screen, focusing the game much less on traditional dodging and more on mastering your small set of moves and playing each section properly. It also adds a time limit to the entire game, and getting hit reduces it farther, while Benton from the first game shows up with items including time extenders to keep you going. The controls are a bit clunky and definitely not what you look for in a shooter, despite being unique. So the gameplay is hit and miss, depending on how open you are for something new. Dare I say it almost feels like playing Street Fighter 2, sitting at the edge of the screen trying to pull off a string of fireballs. It'll also test your tolerance for the amount of groans, grunts, and hucks you can take in the course of a game. Prepare for a non-stop cacophony of hyo hu ria and a lot more of that. But as usual, Aicho and Iki excels in the very same thing that made the first so fun and cool, the visuals and creativity. It's an assault on the senses, and there's no shortage of atmosphere, comedy, and outright ridiculous backgrounds and bosses. The music is even more fantastic, this time with more upbeat tunes, yet still offbeat and weird, to match that otherworldly vibe of the game. There isn't a single thing normal about Aicho and Iki, and that's what makes it such an experience. It's mainly let down by its unique, but inferior gameplay, relegating it to average status overall for being cool to look at, but often a chore to replay. Cloudmaster, or Gokuraku Chukataisen in Japan, completely flies under the radar and is not well known, yet is one of the nice hidden gems on the PC Engine. Not that it's unknown, released in arcades by Taito, and being a popular game for them at the time. It had multiple home ports on the Master System and Famicom as well. It stands out in its design with a Monkey King inspired aesthetic, with you floating on a cloud Goku style, and the enemies and stages being quite creative, along with shopkeepers throughout the game. What makes the PC Engine port unique is it's also enhanced over the early arcade game, with improved and more colorful sprites and a host of updates. It changes up the levels and bosses, with many being completely new, along with a new ability to turn around and fire backwards. The backgrounds are pretty static and flat, but overall this port improves over the arcade game, with exclusive multi-directional levels and much more interesting boss battles. The music is cute, if nothing to rave about, and overall it's an older, simple looking game, albeit with fun and interesting designs. As a port of an arcade game, you can't fault it for its age. And this port takes some nice steps to improve it in graphics, stages, and gameplay. The game is short but challenging, and has the gameplay chops you'd expect from Taito, making it a very good B-tier game in the library, despite its simple appearance. Cloudmaster is a fine addition to the PC Engine library. PC Engine had no shortage of cute em ups, and Koryun is one of its best, most colorful, and great looking games, made by some of the same developers that would eventually release Air Zonk. Koryun is also one of the PC Engine's easiest games, being a great entry level shooter for young kids and beginners alike, with an aesthetic and design that would certainly appeal to a younger audience. It's cute and charming in every way, and you spend much of the levels chasing after fruit falling all over the screen. For score, that fruit is also part of what makes the game easier, as you can rack up a ton of extra lives if you focus on grabbing as much as you can. Graphically, there's a lot of parallax and very little slowdown, and the game is a graphical showcase in general. Each level has multiple bosses, often with multiple forms, and it even has some score attack modes. Yes, it's easy, but also a joy, and one to put on for the kids if you're trying to dazzle them while getting them into trying a shooter. The biggest problem with 
with Koryun is that it doesn't have any good way to increase the challenge, making it really cool yet a breeze for anyone but novices. The hard mode increases bullets and doubles enemy hit points, but is otherwise unchanged, which is simply unfun and a lazy way to boost difficulty. Koryun could have been an A-tier game. The graphics, music, and actual gameplay is all top-notch, but because of this one glaring flaw, it's a game that offers no real challenge aside from a narrow audience, maybe even an S-tier game for young kids, but with a hard mode that's just no fun. It's a B-tier game for me. Speaking of cute em ups, how about another top tier release with the original cotton Fantastic Night Dreams, a very nice port of the arcade original and in some ways improved. It stays very faithful in terms of graphics and level design, even if not quite on par with the arcade. The gameplay translation is really solid, yet somehow more accessible by making the enemies and bosses less unnecessarily tanky and less of a chore to battle against. Cotton always had a complex weapon system with shot upgrades, bomb upgrades, experience, and a magic system featuring both offensive and defensive use, making it a challenge to come to grips with all the game has to offer. It's cute, yet dark Halloween aesthetic was one of the first of its kind and a big part of its appeal, along with the not-so-kind protagonist constantly harassing her fairy guide silk, caring little aside from finding willows to eat. But where this port really shines compared to all of the other ports is in the soundtrack, with a redone mix by T's music that's absolutely legendary. No other version of Cotton, arcade perfect or not, even comes close to the majesty of the PC Engine soundtrack. Along with it being a reasonably accurate arcade conversion in terms of gameplay and graphics, it's my personal favorite version of the game. And while not the best shooter on the PC Engine, it's a must-play port of the classic and near the top of the A tier in my mind. Cybercore was an early release, similar to the much more well-known Dragon Spirit, with Xevious-style gameplay that requires you to both destroy enemies in the sky and bomb down below, only with a weird insect motif that's actually pretty cool. In typical awesome 90s fashion, your name is Rad Ralph, and you've been fused with an alien life form, making you part human and part insect. Much like Dragon Spirit, you get larger and larger as you power up, eventually making dodging more difficult, but with the bonus of a lot more firepower. Different power-ups actually morph you into various insects. The enemy and boss designs are pretty creative, even if it is an early Hue card release, with graphics on the simpler side, and a difficulty that's very accessible until the late stages of the game. It's got a handful of rockin' little chiptunes as well, and the music is good overall. In general, it's seen as an average average shooter on the system, but I personally feel it's a bit underrated. It's not spectacular, but it can still be quite a bit of fun and worth playing if you haven't before, especially if you're new to the genre. Cycle Rider is one of the most coveted, yet obscure, secret shooters on the PC Engine. It's known among Caravan fans as it's really fun and well put together, along with a banging chip tune that's so important for a short score attack mode. Surprisingly well done actually considering it's not an official release. That's right, it's found on only a specific demo version of Seiya Monogatari, Earth Fantasy Stories. 
an RPG CD game, which happens to be the very last game Hudson would ever publish for the PC Engine. Talk about rare. Aside from the common Caravan 8-way shot, you can quickly switch to a powerful beam to take out tankier enemies. And as usual, a horde of them are always flooding the screen in waves and your goal is to kill them as quickly as possible, while not missing all the score pickups and bonuses. Psycho Riders reached sufficient cult status to where repros have been made of just the game itself, for those wanting a physical copy, but it's also easy enough to find in ROM form, for anyone that wants to check out this hidden gem of a caravan mode. Dyson Poo is the first on this list by legendary STG developer Toa Plant, also known in Europe as Twin Hawk, originally released in arcades back in 89. Its most unusual feature is the complete lack of aerial enemies, focusing strictly on ground-based tanks and threats, purposefully giving the game a slow, methodical pace. The other main feature is your squadron of planes you call up, which remain on screen with you adding firepower until they've all been shot down. You can also send them out in a kamikaze attack or double tap for a screen clearing bomb. And really, the most fun and unique part of Dyson Poo is having your squadron out, following you around keeping the screen clear of enemies, and watching them dive bomb as they're taken out. The graphics on the PC Engine release are pretty pedestrian and minimal. The chiptunes are okay, but not on par with the arcade, and the sound effects aren't nearly as meaty, something the Mega Drive port did better, using a similar Yamaha sound chip like the arcade boards. Because Dyson Poo is such a slow-paced game, it's not nearly one of my favorite from Toa Plan, yet it would still get a B as a solid game, as it's old school and underappreciated. While the PC Engine port is good in terms of gameplay. It's not that good in terms of visuals or audio, making it an average version of the game. Not content with a single version of Dyson Poo, they also released it again on PC Engine CD called Dyson Poo Custom. And it's a rare case of being inferior to the original Hue card. The continuous stages are now broken up into levels so they can load off CD. And while some bosses are changed and rearranged, as is the music with a new soundtrack, none of it is all that better than the original. In some cases, there is even less graphical detail than the Hue card game. Some parts of stages are completely missing, and there's less frames of animation in some of the effects. It's clear the developer didn't have a handle on the hardware, nor how to properly take advantage of the format yet. Aside from the remix tracks, you're much better off playing the Hue card, which is at least a solid port of the arcade. Dyson Poo Custom CD really isn't worth the squeeze at all. D is for Darius, or Darius, or Darius, whatever you choose to call it. But the one given is that the PC Engine had a bunch of them, and none of them more rare and coveted by collectors than Darius Alpha, with only 800 copies ever being produced, specifically to previous buyers of the Darius Plus and Super Darius games. If you sent in proof of purchase from each of those games, they mailed you this baby as a thank you, and it now sells for well over a thousand dollars. If you can even find one that's legit, not a complete game, but a custom boss rush mode where you take on every single boss from Plus. Much like Plus, which you'll see later, it also supports the super graphics, with better performance removing a lot of the flicker and slowdown you'd normally get. A pretty darn cool mail order gift, really, but certainly not worth the asking price for anyone but serious collectors. You can find the ROM easily and check it out if you're craving a boss rush mode from this early game in the series. And it's also available on the recently released Darius Cosmic Collection by M2. Don't be fooled by the name. Super Darius on the PC Engine is the very first original Darius game, released on CD in 1990. 
This allowed them to use recordings of the original music and effects from the arcade, making it sound as authentic as possible to the original game. In actuality, the game really is an enhanced version and not just a straight port, at least in terms of bosses, including 26 of them. That's all the bosses from the arcade. Bosses from their newly released Darius 2 in arcades. Plus, bosses that never even made it to the PCB, but existed in design form. You're likely already familiar with what makes the Daria series so unique. Mainly the aquatic theme and unique soundtrack by the legendary Zuntada, and especially the branching paths that add a lot of replay value to the game. Of course, no home port at the time could replicate the giant triple monitor display of the arcade, so they had to adjust considerably for a standard TV, making any home port a compromised version of the original. The two-player mode is removed on this port as well, and you respawn at death compared to the checkpoint system of the arcade. No matter which way you play it, the original Darius is old school to the bone, where dying and losing your power-ups on a difficult stage makes it brutal to continue. But if you dig the series, it's a pretty faithful port given how early it was released as a standard CD game, the first in the series that established such a unique aesthetic and branching mechanic. And squarely in the B tier for me. Next up is Darius Plus, which again, don't be fooled, is the same original Darius game, only a slightly stripped down version released on Hue Card instead of CD several months later. It's basically the same game, only now having to replace the recorded CD music with chiptunes, as well as getting knocked back to only 16 of 26 bosses due to the memory limitation of the Hue Card versus CD, but it's otherwise faithful and even includes super graphic support. Just like Darius Alpha, which eliminates most slowdown and flicker from the game. Same game, so it's also in the B tier, though it's certainly less extensive than the CD port. fourth and final Darius release on the PC Engine, and you guessed it, the super version of Darius 2. What makes it so super? For starters, the soundtrack. This time, instead of trying to copy the arcade PCB like the first game, this Super CD port has completely new and arranged music that's pretty dang rockin'. How rockin'? Well, it depends on your preference, because it's pretty hard to compete with Zuntada. But the remixed tracks are good too. It also differs from the arcade in other ways, notably losing some of the more advanced graphical effects. But again, gaining bosses. Most completely different and new, with some even taken from the first Super Darius game. Overall, Darius 2 was a nice improvement over the original, with more interesting and creative levels less repetition, and better overall game design, because this version is a bit changed up from the arcade, yet still also quite difficult. Many prefer the Mega Drive port, which is more true to the arcade in terms of stages and music, while also being easier on the difficulty by comparison. But either way, if you've always wanted a thing called tuna sashimi, then this Darius is for you, and the PC Engine port is a nice alternative to the arcade. Still a B-tier port in my eyes, as it could have done better being on Super CD to mimic missing graphical effects from the arcade. But if you dig the series, still absolutely worth playing. Dead Moon is not a well-known yet underrated game on the PC Engine. It's not amazing, but the gameplay is solid, and it has some nice graphics and parallax effects for a Hue Card game, and kind of slipped through the cracks, becoming an underrated shooter. Its biggest fault is simply being somewhat generic and not standing out in screenshots, until you actually play it and realize it's well-designed. And while the stages may be a bit generic, the bosses are really creative with some unusually alien and gory skeletal designs with this one Gradius ripoff mini-boss notwithstanding. Your weapons act like a shield, powering you down instead of dying when you get hit, until you're at your lowest level, resulting in death. It also has the feature of turning your ship around during some boss fights to fight them from the opposite direction. You start on the planet's surface and then work your way up into orbit, before battling through both its caverns and underwater areas within its core. 
because the moon has a hidden sea, apparently. But if you haven't played Dead Moon yet and fire it up one evening, you may be surprised to have missed out on a pretty cool shooter. And just better than average at the top of the C tier for me. I apologize in advance for this one. Or should I say the developer should apologize to us kids who inadvertently had to play this Kusoge and waste our parents' money in the process. Deep Blue may look generic and okay, but it has the clear distinction of being the worst shooter on the PC Engine. It may actually be the worst shooter of the 16-bit generation, and then some. And it's not simply due to the generic backdrops or the chiptunes that while charming at first, become extremely repetitive. No. The worst thing about Deep Blue is the atrocious gameplay. Your sub is incredibly weak and can rarely kill what's in front of it before getting nailed. The enemy waves often come hard and fast with no way to actually destroy anything in time, having to simply avoid them instead, which you can absolutely do and cheese the game by sitting in corners of the screen and rarely moving at all. It's like the developer just coded random patterns, never actually tried it out or played the game, and just called it a day. And for some reason, it's letterboxed, removing some of your vertical play area, like they suddenly became an auteur, and thought less vertical space would make it more cinematic and not hinder the gameplay. The ending isn't even an ending, but simply ends, with no credits of any kind. Probably a smart move, with them not wanting anyone to know who was actually behind it. I wanted to give a big shout out here to Wan Man for letting me use his 1cc footage here, so I wouldn't have to go back and play this Kusogi again myself. Nothing about this game is any good and should be avoided at all costs. Aside from morbid curiosity, which some of you out there will clearly now go and do, you know who you are. Hana Twinbee is famous for its great artwork and characters inspired by famous works of Miyazaki and Toriyama, along with its two main characters Twinbee and Winbee, which ended up spawning animes, music CDs, and many other games simply from the popularity of the characters alone. With cute design and unique two-player and power-up mechanics, most notably the love it or hate it bell system. In a nutshell, either a strategic or extremely annoying way to gather power-ups. Bells have to be hit with your shot to change into different power-ups, sometimes having to be shot several or over a dozen times getting to the item you want, and God forbid you shoot it once too many times. Add the fact that they fall off the screen, and a lot of the gameplay ends up being juggling bells, and not just killing enemies. Despite that, Twinbee is a fantastic game, another excellent port by Konami themselves. It certainly does give up graphic detail in the backgrounds and scrolling compared to the arcade, being a Hue card game, but it's still a treat to look at and extremely colorful, and it's far more a treat to play. As if you're not familiar, the arcade original is insanely hard, considered one of the most difficult games of all time. I feel sorry for the poor kids that popped a quarter into that one for a go, only to be savaged by the beast that lay beneath. But the PC Engine port adjusts this, making it very console friendly, and only punishing you once you've progressed quite a bit, and played well to raise the rank built into the game. Of course there are now better ports to play, like the collections on both Saturn and PS1, but for its time, this port was again an example of the incredible work Konami did for the PC Engine. If you looked up Hidden Gem in the dictionary, you'd be staring at a picture of Download, one of the coolest shooters on the console. Yeah, it's kind of an Akira-style ripoff, as it was popular at the time. And the game actually has a graphic novel series behind it, but it ticks almost every box in what makes a good shooter. The gameplay is really fast and fluid, with short levels that don't overstay their welcome and provide ample challenge, while giving you unlimited continues to keep trying. It even has a password system so you can continue where you left off. How often do you see that in a shmup? 
you get a health bar, so although you only get one life, you can take a handful of hits. The chip tunes are simply outstanding, and ones that you'll be humming for the rest of the day after playing it. Visual design is excellent, with creative stages full of parallax and effects. And somehow, on top of it all, they manage to cram an entire story and set of cutscenes throughout the game that are extremely well done, on the level of a CD game, just without the dialogue. Part of the stages take place in the real world, while the other half in the virtual, where you're downloaded and the designs become psychedelic. Oh, and the game actually is notorious for something else. The cursing and poor translation. With some of the funniest game over screens that rival the intro to Zeroing. Download is just a blast from start to finish. And if you own or enjoy PC Engine shooters, it's a must play. One good turn deserves another, and so goes with Download 2, an inevitable sequel to an outstanding and fun original. Is it as good as the original? Yes and no. Is it worthy of the original? Yeah, I'd say so. It is, however, different. Now, a CD game, they went all out with the cutscenes and definitely delivered. Overall, some of the best cinematics on the PC Engine. The music is still a highlight, even if very different from the driving chiptunes of the original, with a lot of good guitar work to take its place. Actually, more than good. It's freaking amazing. The biggest difference is in the design, with the characters looking completely different from the first and more generic. That's not the case for the stages, which are still uniformly weird, psychedelic, gory, and unusual with a ton of variety. It gives the developers license to come up with all sorts of weird layouts and backgrounds. The gameplay is also changed up, a bit more generic and not quite as fast-paced as the first, but also with some good additions like a cycling weapon system similar to Thunder Force. Your health bar is gone with a more typical life system instead, and all the harsh, funny dialogue from the game over screens is removed. Not a negative, but also less entertaining. Despite all this, it's still a very cool game worth playing. Not as difficult as the original, but is longer with more stages. But hey, you get to take on a pretty horrific, gory Hitler monstrosity, and that's always bonus points in any video game. TLDR. Download, download to download. And play some download. Play both. Two games worth your time. Dragon Spirit is considered a classic hit at this point, being a really popular cabinet for Namco in the arcade. And it saw tons of ports on NES, computer platforms, and later on PlayStation, Xbox, Wii, and more. But early in its life, it was first on PC Engine. You power up and get bigger and badder, gaining size and extra heads. Until you're so large, it's tough to dodge. So you focus on routing the levels and quick kills before things get out of control. My favorite thing about Dragon Spirit, well, besides the dragons, because who doesn't like dragons, was the music. And the PC Engine has my favorite renditions with outstanding chip tunes. Stage 2 in particular is just awesome. <laughs> The game is pretty arcade accurate in general, until it isn't. Clearly, once they hit stage 7, 
they ran out of memory on the small U card and had to cut the final levels, opting for just the final castle instead. But the real problem with the final stage is it's borderline broken, with a final stretch with spikes that sometimes are a matter of luck to even get through. You better have that yellow speed up. And if you don't have it for the final boss, you can forget about it. It's game over. So yeah, Dragon Spirit is really cool, and the PC Engine port is quite nice. Until it isn't. Casualty of an early game, limited memory, and someone falling asleep during playtesting the final stage. It's very hard, so luckily most players never even made it to the endgame to see how mangled it was, simply enjoying what the first half of the game had to offer. And really, I could die on stage 2 and be happy with these kind of chiptunes. Dragon Spirit would have been a B tier port, maybe even A tier if it wasn't missing levels, for the great music and solid gameplay. But the mangled end just ruins it for anyone seriously trying to complete it, making it as much a crapshoot as a game of skill. Yes, Dragon Spirit had a sequel, and it's even better than the original, though not nearly as well known or popular. The music is still great, just like the first, and the graphics are improved. They also added a two-player mode, which is always cool in a shmup, also because two dragons are better than one. A charge shot has been added to your arsenal, along with even more dragon colors and types. The arcade version added some cool scaling effects, which unfortunately couldn't be done on the PC Engine at the time, but it's otherwise still a solid port graphically. The difficulty isn't quite as brutal as the first, but still properly hard, made easier in two-player mode, allowing for instant respawn instead of checkpoints. The stage designs are way cooler now, more futuristic in some, and organic in others, even including an H.R. Giger-inspired level, complete with hatching eggs. If you already like Dragon Spirit, Saber is a no-brainer and better in just about every way. A really cool game and highly recommended. Dragons times two with a friend. How can you go wrong? Fantasy Zone was a very early PC Engine release, and a port of the arcade game. Gameplay has always been straightforward, where you take out all the enemy bases on a Defender-style stage, then face off against the boss before moving on. Along the way, you can hit the shop for upgrades, and for its time, the graphics were impressive in the arcade. And while not bad in terms of gameplay, the rest of the PC Engine port falls short. It's just not that impressive graphically or orally, which is a shame as the system's color palette was more than capable of making the game look gorgeous. It either wasn't given the attention it deserved by the developer, or they just didn't have a good handle on the hardware yet at such an early stage. Don't get me wrong, it's a decent way to play Fantasy Zone, but there are much better, including an excellent Mega Drive game by Sunsoft which while not a direct port of the arcade, is still fantastic and honestly even better, or a pretty arcade perfect port on the Saturn. The PC Engine version of this one was a bit early and weak. Not a bad game to play, but lacking in presentation. As a note, there was a nearly completed prototype of a Super Fantasy Zone for PC Engine CD by NEC Avenue, but never made it to market. However, fully playable ROM is out there, and as you can see, the idea was a Space Harrier clone, only starring Opa Opa. I haven't played the game through to rank it personally, and it's also incomplete, but I can tell you it does have a fantastic arranged tune of the Space Harrier theme, and not surprisingly, you can poke the shopkeep inappropriately for some amusing comments. It's easy enough to find if you like this style of game, and haven't tried it before. Yeah. 
Final Blaster is an extremely unique shooter, and there's really not many others like it. The most unusual is the ability to force faster or slower scrolling by moving to the top or bottom of the screen. Pretty jarring for a vertical scroller and takes getting used to. Not to mention all the unfortunate moments that'll arise from enemies coming in at you from above or below, or shooting at you from off screen. Final Blaster is hard enough without said shenanigans. The first three stages are pretty pedestrian and open, but things get really interesting from there on out, with lots of obstacle-based levels and memorization. The other unique feature is your Phoenix Mode, charging up a powerful attack that'll pierce through enemies, walls, and anything else. The rub is that using it burns up any secondary weapons or defenses you picked up. The icing on the cake is the rank system that has four difficulty levels. At the end of each stage, it assesses your current power level and adjusts the next stage accordingly. Don't be fooled though, none of the levels are easy in the latter half. There's only hard, harder, and please have mercy. The graphics don't stand out much, but the stage designs and bosses certainly do, with some later being inventive and even creepy. The chiptunes are also good, par for the course in most PC Engine shooters, but still welcome. Final Blaster is a difficult and deep game that takes a lot of practice to master, but not many will be good enough to see their way to the best parts of the game, let alone survive on the harder ranks, because it also takes no prisoners. Final Soldier is the first on this list of the Soldier trilogy of caravan shooters on the PC Engine, though it's not the first game, nor a final. It's actually the middle child coming after Super Star Soldier, and just like the middle child, it gets a bad rap, despite being worthy of the series. It's got all the staples, including fast gameplay with adjustable speed, good music, and the expected 2 and 5 minute time attack modes, used for the Hudson Caravan competitions. It's known as the most beginner friendly of the trio, though it does get properly tough at the end. It is the most generic of the games in terms of enemy design and stages without anything that stands out like the other two, actually feeling more like the original Star Soldier 8-bit games in terms of design. I admit, it's my least favorite of the three, despite being a game I still find fun, while others really enjoy it. But what's not up for debate is the excellent caravan mode that's as addicting as they come, being easy to complete and play, but incredibly tough to max out and master. At the end of the day, if you like the soldier games, you'll likely enjoy this one too. It's got the fast, responsive control the series is known for, and while the least popular of the three, is still a better vertical shooter than most other games of the generation. Force Gear is another hidden caravan time attack by Konami, this time inside Kojima's classic dating sim, Tokimeki Memorial, and it's as good as you'd expect from Konami, pulling off a caravan mode with super fast and responsive gameplay, huge sprites and great visuals, fantastic music, and of course a parade of homages to their Gradius and Salamander games. It's not easy making a solid and deep caravan mode in a horizontal scroller making them quite rare, so Konami gets huge props for pulling off what many could not, and is easily the best of its kind. You have a standard shot and secondary weapon pickups that are crucial to maintain in terms of having the firepower to quick kill incoming waves. You also have a small option that acts as a shield, always positioned in the opposite direction of your movement, when in front absorbing enemy fire and also providing a powerful beam for high damage. Force Gear is an excellent caravan that's criminally underexplored and could use a proper competition one day to suss out truly high scores and hidden bonuses Konami expertly baked into the mode. M2 did everyone a service by including this gem on the PC Engine Mini, an excellent way to play. Force Gear deserves a spot near the top with some of the console's best.
I'll just come out and say it. Forgotten Worlds on PC Engine is the best home port of Capcom's classic that's been released, at least until Capcom's arcade collections many generations later. Released for the Super CD, not only is it complete with all stages, but looks and sounds better than any of the other ports, and has a two-player mode that other ports lack. It's most known for its rotation mechanic, allowing you to fire in 360 degrees, and contains shops along the way for upgrading your arsenal. The biggest problem with the PC Engine port isn't the game itself, but the limited two-button controller, and really needs a three or six-button pad at minimum. But given the right controller, Forgotten Worlds looks good, sounds good, with well-done CD renditions of the original music, and plays like a toned-down version of the very difficult arcade original. At the time, this port was the one to own, and still holds up today. Ah, Galaga. What console didn't have a version of the games? And rightfully so, being one of the best-selling shooters of all time. Known as Galaga 88 on PC Engine and later released as Galaga 90 on the Turbo Graphics, it's nowhere near just a straight port of the arcade classic. Instead, adding quite a bit of variety and flair that made it well-received, reviewed, and popular on the console. The graphics and animation are all updated and new along with new mechanics like sacrificing your ship to the tractor beam for a chance of increasing your firepower, or a warp feature that lets you access new dimensions and levels. It even changes it up with some actual vertical scrolling stages and boss battles. And along the way, it peppers in some cute humor the original didn't have, and is overall whimsical and fun, with bonus stages, dancing aliens, and more. They really went all out to make the Galaga of the future, and they succeeded. I've never been very good at the original, and it could only keep my attention for so long. So the best compliment I can give is this one manages to do just that. This PC Engine port is one of the coolest versions of Galaga you can play. Gate of Thunder, baby. To know it is to love it. Basically the PC Engine version of Thunder Force 3, made by the exact same designer and programmer duo who made Part 3. And it shows. The stages are creative, the gameplay is fast, and the soundtrack is absolutely rockin'. Not only is it as good a game as Thunder Force 3, for me personally, it's even better. benefiting from the later release of the Super CD platform. In fact, many would argue that while not as flashy as the follow-up Lords of Thunder, it's the better of those two games as well in terms of gameplay and control. It has a fantastic intro that pumps you up. Every level is packed with variety and large enemies and sprites, and is a real showcase for the system if there ever was one. Thus, it was the packing game with the release of the Turbo Duo in the US. I can give you details about the weapon system and options, but it really doesn't matter. Gate of Thunder is simply one of the best shooters on the system. And if you haven't played it, just go do it. End of story. When I refer to some games as one of those weird PC Engine shooters, God Panic is one of them. It's not a question of what's so weird about it, it's more a question of what isn't. And that's what makes it so amusing and fun to play through. Yes, it's a pretty simple game graphically, but the creativity more than makes up for it. An odd mix of Japanese folklore and whatever happened to cross the developers' minds that day, apparently. 
It also just controls and plays well, without any slowdown or fuss. Has fast bullet speeds, and some pretty great and varied music as well. And of course, every properly weird Japanese shooter needs to have some Tanuki Nutsack. Just saying. This may be the first you've seen in this list, but it won't be the last. God Panic is a solidly fun game with wackiness to boot, and that's what I like about it most. Even if it's a pretty average shooter overall, it definitely earns its only on PC Engine ribbon and wears it with pride. You knew it was coming once we got to G, and there's no other bonafide Konami classic the likes of Gradius. Do I even need to review it? Explain it? Tell you why you should play it? Not only is it a great port of Konami's original masterpiece, but it's even improved over the arcade, at least visually and orally. The color palette is brighter and more vibrant, and the chiptunes sound even more beautiful on the PC Engine. Yes, it's not as hard as the brutal arcade game, which is a good thing for console gamers, but it's still plenty tough and not the easier experience of the NES port. This was Konami's very first PC Engine port and only a 2 megabit hue card, so they get props for the nice conversion. It has some slowdown, especially when you're fully powered, along with sprite flicker, yet never gets out of control and feels great to play. They even added an exclusive new stage not found in the arcade. It also has hidden bonus stages on multiple levels if you're good enough to unlock them. So grab your power-ups, select your loadout, and don't let the options thief rob you blind. Because Gradius is old school fabulous, and the PC Engine port is fantastic. Konami ported a total of 5 games to the PC Engine, and Gradius 2 Gopher is the crown jewel. Now on Super CD and with a lot more experience behind their belt, Konami went all out to make this the best home port of what's my personal all-time favorite Gradius game. The PC Engine port is nearly identical to the arcade in terms of graphics, only at a slightly lower resolution, includes a cool CD intro, and audio identical to the arcade, toned down versus the brutal arcade version, yet still plenty challenging. It again adds an exclusive stage not seen in the arcade. Dying restarts you at the beginning of the level, which sounds brutal, but is actually better as it gives you more chance to power up again. Compared to the arcade checkpoints that often resulted in a nearly impossible location to recover from. Gradius 2 introduced many of the series tropes that continued in future games, like the speed zone, indestructible spider walker, and choosing your weapon loadout at the start. And the game is just beautiful from the opening stage with its flaming suns and dragons, the crystal fields, and eventual boss rush featuring old friends and music from Salamander. If you're a Gradius fan and never played Gradius 2, I got news for you. You're not a Gradius fan. Now go play it. We're back on the road again with the weird and wonderful world of PC Engine shooters, this time with Hana Takadaka. But not only is this game weird and wonderful, it's also one of my favorite hidden gems on the system. Yes, it happens to be a fantastic game developed by Natsume, famous for many other games of that era like the Pocky and Rocky series and Shadow of the Ninja, among many others. Hana Takadaka loosely translates to Long Nosed Goblin, part of Japanese folklore, and the game is completely steeped in it. It's like Parodius, only parodying the folklore, and you're fighting against shape-shifting Tanuki. And yes, where there's Tanuki, there's Giant Ballsack, which the game has a generous helping of. You grab scrolls which increase your size and add to your hit points, but also make you a larger target, while taking hits shrinks you down a level. You 
also have a charge shot that varies based on your weapon choice and is pretty critical, as your base weapon doesn't do all that much damage. Each stage has two parts of a broken seal to find. One you get after killing the boss, but the other hiding in the level itself, which takes you to a bonus stage where you have to find the Tanuki again for the item and return back to the main stage, and getting them all uncovers the entire ending screen as a reward. It also has a password system as you play, so you can skip levels and start where you left off. Despite there not being a lot of parallax, the sprites and backgrounds pop off the screen with depth, and the overall design is as creative as it gets with a lot of movement and color. Enemies and bosses are especially creative, with them reverting to their Tanuki form after being defeated. The music was done by Kinoyo Yamashita of Castlevania fame, and while not on that level, it's still really good and fits the game perfectly. Hana Takadaka is one of those games that has a lot to talk about, and it's a hidden PC Engine gem if there ever was one. An absolute must play for any fan of the genre. Oh look, the second game in a row of the weird and wonderful world of PC Engine shooters. Honey in the Sky. Some think you're playing as a dildo, but he looks a lot more like Mr. Hanky to me. In fact, if someone could come out with that hack and have you firing off turds, I'd totally play that version. Actually, you're a terracotta clay doll called a Hani, used in traditional Japanese funerals. And yes, I had to look that up on a wiki. What am I, a historian? The gameplay gimmick is you rotate your gun with one of the buttons, being able to shoot in any direction. The problem is you can only rotate it one way, and it spins pretty slow to boot, making it kind of cumbersome to play. It also has a similar mechanic to Final Blaster, where you partially control the scrolling speed by moving up and down on the screen. You can also access a shop at any time from the menu to spend your collected points on all kinds of upgrades, which is kind of cool versus having to wait for a shop or end of a stage. Though keep in mind, the deep upgrade and menu system is all in Japanese, so it'll take some figuring out and translation. Hani also has some really catchy and relaxing chiptunes in its favor which you'll be humming long after you've played. So it has some good ideas and can be fun at times, but the overall pace and cumbersome control hampers the experience. The late game is actually much more interesting in where the game really gets going and comes into its own, but it also gets so difficult that few will get to see and enjoy it for long. So between the rotation mechanic and cool upgrades that spice up the game the farther you get, there's actually a good game hiding in here somewhere. But in the end, the very basic graphics and poor controls relegate it to more of a very flawed, yet interesting game. Hawk F123 is one of the least interesting games on the system, and near the bottom tier of games. Not surprising in the slightest, given it was published by Pac-In Video. Thankfully, it's not nearly as bad in the gameplay. It may even be the best game Pac-In Video released, but that's also not saying much. It's actually a sequel to a near equally poor game they released called Powergate, which you'll see later in the video. Hawk F123 is better in some ways, but again, that's not saying much. As a super CD game, the graphics are much improved over their previous efforts. Don't get me wrong, not great, but better than their other crap. Heck, they even tried, with a little cutscene intro at the start, so I give them some credit. But then you play the game and, oh, oh my, you're kidding, right? Why is everything moving as slow as molasses, including your shot? Am I playing in 50Hz mode or something? The one good thing I can say about it is that it has a decent CD soundtrack. Believe it or not, the final stage finally gets interesting. Too bad the rest of the game wasn't anything like it, and too bad it can't maintain a decent frame rate regardless of stage. Just because it's better than their other crap games doesn't mean it's not also a crap game. They just tried a bit harder and squeezed out a slightly shinier turd, and that's all the time I'm wasting on this one. I recommend you not waste your time on it at all.
Heavy Unit was a really cool looking but incredibly brutal arcade game by Taito. Back in 1989, featuring the ability to transform between ship and mech, it stood out to me in terms of its really creative stage layouts, but also frustratingly difficult to recover from death. The worst thing about Heavy Unit is the pea shooter you start out with, making it an impractical slog when you're not powered up. Unfortunately, the PC Engine version keeps it close to arcade accuracy, while taking a big hit in the graphics department, making one of the coolest aspects of the game a lot less cool. It will absolutely wreck you on an R-Type level until you memorize it, only without the awesomeness of the R-Type port. Now don't get me wrong, it's not a bad port, but it just doesn't look nearly as vibrant or nice. Much of the designs have lost their charm, so you're left with seriously tough gameplay that'll kick your ass from the opening stage, a level of bullet dodging that veterans will appreciate, while anyone less skilled will quit in disgust, not seeing incentive to continue. And while I'm all for arcade perfect conversions, including difficulty, the problem with the PC Engine port is it maintains that difficulty while stripping much of the other things that made the arcade original so cool. Be warned on this one, but masochists have at it. Hellfire is one of Torplan's two horizontal shooters they ever released, along with Zero Wing, both of which I enjoyed quite a bit. And while Hellfire may be the lesser of the two, it's still a really solid and fun shooter with some excellent music. The gimmick are your directional shots, which you can cycle through quickly, and you'll need to master that ability to get anywhere in the game. I did a detailed comparison video of this port versus the Mega Drive for anyone that's interested. But the gist of it, in my mind, is that the PC Engine port is slightly inferior. Despite being a CD game, it was an early port, so the graphics take a hit and aren't as detailed overall. The gameplay though is where it mostly falters for me, feeling like an overly easy, watered down experience versus the Mega Drive port, which was ported by Toa Plan themselves and closer to arcade level. On the plus side, the remixed soundtrack in this port is phenomenal, again done by the incredible tease music, and I even prefer it to the original tunes. also has a two-player mode, something the Mega Drive port lacks. And of course, you can't ever go wrong with a cool CD intro cutscene featuring Waifu, a story that was completely created for this port alone. So overall, while I do prefer the Mega Drive port, this one is also solid and has some aspects that are better, making it one I also come back to, especially for that rockin' soundtrack. definitely worth playing if you haven't before, and even more so if you're a beginner and want to enjoy it without the brutal difficulty of the Mega Drive port. <laughs> haven't heard of Hyper Nova Blast? Don't feel bad, neither had I until I caught up with the homebrew scene, the second shooter released by developer Mindrack after their first game Meteor Blaster DX. Hypernova is a reimagining of Nova Blast on ColecoVision from back in 1983, now CD-based which allows for good selection of music. Though it plays the tracks in order as you go, you can also choose which ones you want to hear and play what you like. It also supports up to 5 players simultaneous in local co-op. Even though it's pretty basic, it's pretty cool to still see games being made for the PC Engine, so I had to include it in this list. Image Fight, Irem's classic hit that you either love, hate, or love to hate. And the only reason to hate it is the legendary difficulty, because it's an otherwise brilliant game. If you can manage to get very far, chances are you'll love it. You pick up either blue or red options that either fire fixed or in the opposite direction that you're moving, and you pick up special weapon attachments that affix to the front of your ship and augment your firepower. But in Image Fight, strategy is the name of the game. Think of it as a vertical R-Type in terms of gameplay design, as you won't be getting anywhere on Reflex alone. 
Every stage, enemy wave and boss is meticulously designed to savage the unprepared. Whether the stages are wide open or obstacle based, this is a memo heavy game based on practice and having the right loadout for the right moments. Oh, and let's not forget image fights claim to brutal fame, the penalty zone. If you don't play really well through the opening stages and kill enough enemies, you end up in a penalty level that's so damn hard, it'll make the rest of the game seem like practice. Have fun with that, or just reset and start over. My only real complaint on this port, aside from the understandably downgraded graphics, is the music. which while still retaining the good original tunes isn't the greatest translation. The PC Engine sound chip is capable of much better. Is it still hard as hell? You bet. Is it arcade hard? Not quite, which I'm alright with. Go and play the Saturn port if you want to experience the arcade original in all its glory and brutality. I'm happy with the slightly more forgiving version. But that's like saying Sandman was slightly more forgiving than Iron Mike. They'll both kick your ass in a hurry, and this port will do just that. In the end, not quite an S-tier port, simply for the downgraded graphics and music, but still an excellent release and easily worth a spot in the A-tier. Unlike the original, Image Fight 2 is a PC Engine exclusive. Is it as good as the original? I wouldn't say that, but it is so similar it's tough to tell them apart. It's more of the same strategic, memory heavy and brutal gameplay of the original, now on CD with improved music and visuals. Not quite on the same level in terms of stage design and creativity, yet still worth playing for anyone who loved the first. What always stood out most to me about this sequel is how they took the penalty zone of the original and somehow managed to make it even harder. And I showed just that in my top 5 hardest PC Engine shooters video a while back. Now, you don't even get power-ups in the penalty zone. Having to somehow navigate the entire gauntlet with only a pea shooter, it's disgustingly hard. But if you can somehow manage to get through it, or better yet, avoid it, the rest of the game is smooth sailing by comparison. In fact, the final boss is surprisingly easy, making you wonder if they just figured that you'd have given up by now anyway. So not quite as inspired, just a lot more of the same. One thing the sequel does live up to is the legendary difficulty that Image Fight is known for. Kiaidan has the coolest, kitschiest anime style intro in a video game, and I love it. It captures everything you love about the giant robot craze and wraps it in a vocal track that could easily be mistaken as something from a real TV series. In other words, kicks the game off right. If you enjoy the genre and kaiju, you'll find Kiaidan to be a good time. The music remains uniformly cool throughout, and the graphics, while not on the level of the top PC Engine games, are also above average and integrate parallax nicely. Though the stars of the show are the giant robots and kaiju you battle, you've got multiple weapons to toggle on the fly, Thunder Force style which you'll need for the huge variety of enemies on display. One of the game's best features. It always seems like it's throwing something new and novel at you to keep from getting bored, with not much ever being reused from stage to stage. Each of the five weapons has a powerful charge attack, and you'll need it to finish off any of the bosses, which in proper giant robot fashion won't die without a flashy finishing move. There's rarely a break in the action, and it's a properly fun shooter with comedy and style, a true hidden gem, and only on the PC Engine. Q 
Yoku Tiger, known as Twin Cobra in the West, was one of Toa Plan's most influential and best-selling games. Popular shooters that followed, like Raiden, wouldn't have existed without Q Tiger. It refined the formula started with Tiger Heli and turned their solid yet rudimentary first effort into one of the most badass and unforgiving arcade cabinets of the time. Yes, the graphics are a bit on the simple side. It's an older game, but it's got it where it counts. Addicting gameplay that requires both strategy and reflex to master, and has that elusive just one more go quality that keeps you coming back. Part of that is the awesome music and some of Toaplan's best work. The arcade original is a brutal game, with Toaplan's infamous bullet AI that always seems to lead and track your movement, knowing where you're going to be next. The PC Engine version is toned down in difficulty just enough to make the game more accessible, while retaining the checkpoints and getting properly tough toward the latter half. The Mega Drive port retained the brutal difficulty of the arcade and then some, which some extremely seasoned players prefer, but many find impenetrable, while its downgraded graphics make it a bit of an eyesore visually. The PC Engine port looks better, sounds great, and is a nice balance of fun and challenging gameplay for most, and the port I play most often. You can also play it on M2's recently released Ultimate Tiger Collection, along with the arcade originals, which I did an in-depth preview video for as well. It's not a perfect port, as some of the late checkpoints are poorly placed, and the graphics aren't quite as good as the arcade, but overall it's a great port and great fun, and an A-tier game on the system. So go play some Ultimate Tiger. It's great! Eldis is yet another obscure but very cool shooter, this time a cute em up but looks are deceiving as it's not for kids when it comes to difficulty, with six long stages featuring tons of bosses and mini-bosses that never seem to end. Eldis is colorful, has a good CD soundtrack, and is endlessly creative. It starts off with a cute cutscene where you and your girlfriend are doodling on the wall, when a black hole suddenly opens and she's abducted into an alternate universe. You hop in your ship, choose a shot type, and head into battle. Most stages consist of multiple areas where you'll be flying through a cityscape one minute, then entering the sewers down below for the other half of the stage, before taking on more mini-bosses along the way. Charming and fun, yet full of strategy and challenge along with a good execution. I had a good time playing through Eldis as a kid, and still do, so I consider Eldis another hidden gem on the system. In accordance with my orders from the mother ship, I have arrived at the appointed point of 1990 hours space-time. Legion is a bad game. Surprising given it's got the renovation seal of approval, which graced some otherwise fantastic games like Gyarus and Granada. But what makes Legion interesting are the reasons it's bad. It's not sluggish in control like the terrible Deep Blue, nor are the graphics all that terrible. Legion is bad because it makes some really odd choices that ruin the experience then wraps it in gameplay so unbalanced that you're floating along board one moment, then cursing the game for its insane difficulty the next. It's just all over the place in the worst possible way. When it's hard, it's really hard, with bullets coming at breakneck speed. When it's slow, you're just waiting for the next wave of insanity. But adding to the oddball choices is the in-game narration. That'd be amusing if it wasn't so incredibly distracting. The Imperial troops are probably sipping coffee down in their hold while they pick their frozen nose hairs. It's not that plenty of other shmups didn't feature voice acting as you play, but here the narration is so front and center, and so calm, as if he's reading from a diary on his trip across the universe, while the background music is still playing so he's competing with it, almost talking over it completely out of place, and sometimes during gameplay moments where you need to actually concentrate and play the game. Let's have the computer out there look up the central position of this fortress for me. 
visitors appear on the screen of the SF90's main computer. Just so, so bizarre. And it's the main feature that the game is harassed for. If you ever see the end of Legion, congratulations, as you've done what most cannot, or will not. And it doesn't help that the music is overall pretty lame and forgettable. Legion is one of the hardest shooters on the console, and one of the worst, but for all the wrong reasons. Lords of Thunder, King of Awesome and Master of Men, beacon of a dying console that showed the competition how it's done. The most metal soundtrack to grace a console of that generation. Over the top graphics, effects, and huge sprites that defined what was possible, the very definition of a badass video game. To see it was to want it. To hear it was to rock it. Not a single owner of the console didn't own it or covet it. Developed yet again by the same duo who made Gate of Thunder and the early Thunder Force games. It's a shooter to never be forgotten. Is it a perfect game? It isn't. It was a bit on the easy side, similar to Thunder Force 3, and pretty good for beginners. And while the gameplay is solid and fun, it was easily mastered without a lot of longevity for scoring or repeated play, aside from harder difficulty. No, Lords was all about the spectacle and killer soundtrack by T's Music. It made you want to rock out with your jock out, and in that sense, there was no game that did it better. No matter how you play, or on what you play, Lords of Thunder is a must play. It's a game I still come back to time and again despite being able to blow through it in my sleep. Not for the challenge, but because it's like playing in a rock concert with an old friend. And that never, ever gets old. Lords of Thunder is one for the ages. Lost Sunheart is a tough game to review, even quickly, because it's simultaneously creative and unusual, but also very straightforward and average in terms of gameplay. It doesn't do anything wrong and is competent all around. In fact, quite hard in the latter half of the game that'll give most a real challenge. And the music is well done and catchy, along with creative and weird enemy and boss designs. The graphics aren't anything to write home about, and the color palette is pretty basic, but the uniqueness of everything makes up for it. For those that can actually read Japanese, you can play a story mode, which adds cutscenes throughout the game. As you progress, you end up using new ships, depending on the stage you're playing, which adds some variety to the mix. It's pretty hard to stand out on the PC Engine with so many shooters. So what would normally be a solid and creative title ends up a bit overshadowed by other, better games like Hana Takadaka. But if you're craving a challenge and an unusual mix of surreal bosses, you could certainly do worse. At least to me, Lost Sunheart is decent, but not impressive enough to remain memorable. Oh man, was I excited when a Macross game released for PC Engine. Being a massive fan of the series, I'd pretty much play anything with the name on it, good, bad, or ugly. 
and while Macross 2036 didn't break any new ground or end up being much more than your average shooter. Combined with my love of the series, it was a game I enjoyed. It turns out original designer Haruhiko Mikimoto was hired to contribute to the game. Being on CD, it had plenty of cutscenes for unique story between stages, where you play as Maria, the daughter of Max and Melia from the series. And yeah, uh, she looks it. Fan service, anyone? Music is important in any Macross game, and the CD format allowed them to do the series justice with some tunes straight from the movie, making any fan giddy. Playing a Macross shooter to the original score? Check. I'm giddy. thing is, reality sets in quickly and how very average a shooter it actually is. You don't get to control your own transformation, instead playing as a fighter during the main stages, and transforming into Batroid during boss fights, playing much like Forgotten Worlds. Some stages let you play in Jerwalk mode where the layout is more obstacle based and slower paced. You get a shop in between stages very much like UN Squadron, where you can purchase special attacks, similarly limited in use. So how much you enjoy this one completely depends on your nostalgia for the series. The visuals, music, sound effects, cutscenes, everything will just get you in the mood to watch the film again. It's not nearly as good as the best Macross shooter ever made. Scrambled Valkyrie for the Super Famicom, yet it is a cool but average at best shooter that hits all the right buttons when it comes to milking us fanboys and girls for all we're worth, faithful in all the ways it needs to be, replicating what we love about the series. And for that, we Macross fans are thankful. Magical Chase is notorious mainly for its insane asking price, being a late release by Quest on the PC Engine, and the very final game ever released in the US for the Turbo Graphics. Try several hundred dollars for the Japan version, and several thousand dollars for the ultra rare US release. We're not talking about sealed or graded, but just a decent copy of the game. And while no game is likely worth thousands, Magical Chase has the benefit of being a fantastic game one of the best queued em up shooters on the system. And while many cite the colorful graphics and even the really great chiptunes composed by Hitoshi Sakimoto and Masaharu Iwata who went on to score Ogre Battle and Final Fantasy Tactics, what really makes Magical Chase excellent is the gameplay. Sometimes a shooter doesn't need to have unusual or complex mechanics, but gets the fundamentals and execution just right to where a game is simply a joy to play and that's Magical Chase. There are some differences between the Japan and US version, which was updated with a new castle background and enemies on stage one, along with a different shop that looks like a pumpkin head instead of a balloon. Your character Ripple is also redrawn, though the difference is minor. It's not an overly difficult game and experienced players will finish it pretty easily, but it's also a good sweet spot without being overly easy like similar game Core Yoon. No matter which version you play, you'll quickly realize it's a really well-made shooter, with enemy patterns and tight controls programmed by someone that knew what makes a good one. Along with the original Air Zong, it's one of the best overall cute, colorful shooters on the system, and absolutely an S-tier game with an S-tier price. Metamore Jupiter is one of the most obscure PC Engine exclusive games which didn't get much attention, which is a shame as it's actually a neat shooter with some unique mechanics and graphical effects rarely seen on the console. The obvious mechanic is the bi-directional gameplay where you can flip your ship 180 and play in the opposite direction, a gameplay element that's constantly being taken advantage of, not only with enemy waves, but stages that play in every direction. You get three weapon types to cycle through at any time, and those weapons are augmented based on the combination of color orbs arranged at the top of the screen. An area Metamore Jupiter excels in is its presentation. It's extremely creative in its stage layouts, and has some really long ones that transition pretty seamlessly from one locale to another, creating a nice sense of continuity. 
It's also a graphical showcase for its time, with faux scaling and rotation effects among bosses and stages, something rarely seen on the PC Engine. Aside from a handful of basic backgrounds, many of the stages all have lots of movement, rotation, or often outright psychedelic effects. Metamore Jupiter has a lot going for it, and combined with the bi-directional gameplay, it's a pretty special game, without much anything like it of that generation. Meteor Blaster DX was the first homebrew game released by Mindwreck, prior to the later Defender-style game Hypernova Blast shown earlier. In this case, it's an Asteroids game with similar mechanics and a CD soundtrack. And yes, in this day and age, there's certainly cooler Asteroid clones to play. I said it before, it's cool that homebrew games are still being made for the console, so it's nice to support the developers making them for us by checking it out and letting them know your thoughts. Monster Lair, also known as Wonder Boy 3, is half shooter and half platformer, and half a game is enough to be part of this list. A port of the original arcade game, you spend the first half of each level platforming as your health drains, while collecting fruit to keep it topped off, and the second half riding your dragon like any other horizontal shooter. It's as fun and nostalgic as the arcade original, and this CD conversion is the best version of its time. It was an early and base CD game, so it lacks the parallax scrolling of the arcade, but is otherwise colorful with huge sprites and plays as it should. It also sports some excellent redone CD tracks that are a joy to listen to and unique to this version. It's a pretty huge game too, at 14 levels, though the gameplay doesn't really change much throughout. But if you're a fan of this classic, then the PC Engine CD version is definitely a good one to check out. Irem rarely disappoints when it comes to any of their games, but especially their shooters. Every game is somehow novel and unique, and the wonderful Mr. Helly is no exception. Irem themselves ported this game to the PC Engine as a Hue card. Aside from some minor slowdown and expected flicker, it plays great and is the best port of the game at the time. Basically, you're a mini chopper with legs. Stages are broken into halves, where the first is partly auto-scrolling, while the second half gives you full range of movement and is more puzzle-like in nature. You get three upgradable weapons to switch between, along with little bombs that you can drop while walking. Mr. Heli is as much about secrets and puzzles as it is about shooting down the constant waves of enemies that come in from all sides, along with a time limit in the latter parts of the stage. So part of the gameplay is figuring out the best and fastest way through each level. It's surprising such a great and unique game never got a sequel, nor did many other games ever really copy it. The graphics are nice and colorful, but nothing exceptional. And the music is okay, but not as memorable as many of their other games. It's really the gameplay where Mr. Heli shines and is always fun to come back to and play. The PC Engine port not only gives you the extremely difficult arcade mode, but an option for a normal mode which while still not easy, is definitely far more accessible to most console gamers in general, and a very welcome addition. It simply controls perfect and is a breath of fresh air versus many traditional shooters. Not only is this port a great way to play it, but with the normal mode as an option, the preferred way for many to enjoy without the crushing difficulty of the arcade original.
Nexer isn't only one of the greatest shooters of the entire PC Engine library, it's also one of the best of the generation. Developed by Kaneko, the same company behind Aero Blasters, and published by Naxitsoft, it was a late Super CD release and a masterclass in game design. It begins with a beautiful opening and sets the stakes for the rest of the game, and then thrusts you into an opening level that's a showcase for what the system could do. Music is one of the most epic opening tracks to a shooter ever composed. Simply a perfect, mind-blowing opening to what becomes an exceptional game. Part of that is its simplicity. You have your main shot to power up and a handful of secondary weapons. That's it. No bombs, no gimmicks. And when the gameplay is perfection, you simply don't need it. The ship controls like a dream, the perfect speed so there's no need to adjust it. The gameplay and stage design is very reminiscent of Image Fight, and no doubt Kaneko took inspiration from that classic, only streamlined it to be more friendly and less brutal. The stage layouts, enemy patterns, and bosses are very strategic, where knowing what's coming and how to approach each area is key. It's a shooter where learning the levels is essential, but once you do, it feels like a dance, moving from one wave to the next and enjoying the colorful scenery and music along the way. And holy hell, is the music good in this game. The designs are not only styled after Gundam, but they actually use multiple voice actors from the Gundam series in the game's cutscenes. Even the sound effects in the game are some of the best the PC Engine had to offer, many sounding straight out of an anime. Nexer is an all-out top-tier production, along with being a top-tier shooter. I dedicated an entire video a while back to the masterpiece that is Nexer, that you can check out after this video if you're interested to learn much more about the game. But suffice to say, it's a must-play. It's also not the only version of the game released, as it was also part of Naxitsoft's Summer Carnival series, which includes a full caravan mode for the competition, with its own unique stage and absolutely rockin' catchy music. Released as Nexer Special Summer Carnival 93, it's a plain white cover which includes the mode and the full game, though with the great cutscenes removed. Unlike most other caravan shooters on the console, the main release didn't include it as an option, which is a bummer, as it's a really important part of the package. So you either get the main game with everything intact, or the special version release with the main game and caravan, but with the cutscenes removed, almost requiring ownership of both at the time to get the full experience of one or the other. Nexer is known among PC Engine fans as one of the greats. Ordine was developed by Namco and is a not quite cute em up with the gameplay of Gradius and a shop system with upgrades for flavor. And while it's fun to play with them and upgrade, the shop limits you on buying one at a time and many weapons are time limited so they don't last indefinitely. Luckily, it's actually a well done and solid horizontal shooter, almost like an easier version of said Gradius. You get to respawn at death instead of checkpoints until you continue. The graphics are bright and colorful, though not nearly as funny or creative as something like Perot. The music was done by Shinji Hoso, the composer for Dragon Spirit and other Namco games, and it's well done and catchy here, though not in the same league. The PC Engine Hue card was a very early release, and while the gameplay is solid and intact, the graphics had to be simplified from the arcade, mainly any of the scaling or rotating objects removed or done in a simpler fashion, parallax removed, and just a lot of the cool effects missing entirely. 
It's the kind of stuff the PC Engine did easily later in its life, once developers got a handle on the hardware. But as an early Hue card, the presentation is very much watered down. But despite its simplicity, it's a game I enjoyed as a kid. It doesn't reinvent any wheels, but it's colorful, has catchy tunes, and the gameplay is solid, while not being too difficult and easy enough to play through and enjoy. Override is a blast to play, and one of the most fun PC Engine shooters you've likely never heard of. It plays like a compile game on crack, with a breakneck pace and zero slowdown to speak of, along with a large variety of weapons to play around with. You also get an energy bar instead of one-hit kills, which can be replenished with pickups. But the most fun weapon is an awesome charge blast that powers up by simply not firing, helping clear the screen of enemies and bullets, and indispensable for the bosses. The graphics are nothing special, focusing more on ensuring the game plays at a flawless 60 frames and without a hiccup, and the music has its moments, but isn't spectacular. It's just a very simple, easy to pick up and blast shooter with decent chip tunes that I often come back to and replay for its pure, undiluted speed, feeling like a simplified version of a soldier game. But it's also a shame, as if it had a little bit more graphical pizzazz and imagination. Override has the gameplay chops to have been a top tier shooter on the system, as opposed to a guilty pleasure. But it is a guilty pleasure I keep coming back to, earning it a solid ranking in this list. P47 is a port of Jalico's arcade release, a World War II horizontal shooter without any real distinguishing features, aside from simply being a decently fun to play game. The graphics are pretty pedestrian for 1988, and the power-ups are so basic you never feel like it's upgraded much at all, opting for realism over interest. The feeling of always being slightly underpowered continues throughout the game, so it's simply part of the design. And if the arcade was already simple looking overall, the PC Engine port doesn't do it any favors. It changes up the opening stage for some reason, but it's not any more interesting than what it replaced. Some of the backgrounds are single static colors with nothing else going on. Most importantly though, the gameplay is intact and fast without much compromise or slowdown. And they even included the parallax layers from the arcade on stages that did have it. So yes, P47 is a solid shooter and a solid port, just not anything very memorable. But if you like a challenging World War II shooter in a horizontal format, which isn't all that common, it's a perfect example of a basic yet well-executed game that simply hasn't aged all that well, but still shouldn't be forgotten. More famous Konami classics on the PC Engine with Parodius Da, the original game in the series, as usual ported by Konami themselves with excellent results. To know Parodius is to love Parodius, at least until you come face to face with its unrelenting rank system that'll punish anyone thinking this cute game is just for kids. Parodius has always been about as tough as the series it parodies. Basically Gradius, only sillier and with more ship variety along with really catchy music that parodies the classics. The absolute best home port this generation was released later on the Super Nintendo with nearly arcade perfect graphics, music, and even an exclusive stage on top of every arcade level. That being said, this early Hue card release is no slouch. Because memory was limited on the smaller Hue card, a couple levels from the arcade are missing. What the PC Engine port does do better is performance, having nearly no slowdown to speak of. The PC Engine port also has my absolute favorite, adorable opening. A big celebration by many of the characters in the game, strutting across the screen in various comedic ways. If you're looking for an arcade-perfect experience, the Saturn port is outstanding. But at the time, if you owned a PC Engine and were into shooters, this port was an absolute must-buy and a great way to play the game.
what can I say about possibly the ugliest game on the PC Engine without many other redeeming qualities to offset it? Oh yeah, I can say it was published by Pac-In Video. That explains it yet again. The previous game to Hawk, F123, that I covered earlier. The best thing I can say is at least it plays better than Deep Blue. Sadly, it looks even worse. It literally looks like an 8-bit Master System game, except I've seen way better looking Master System games. Everything has this weird black border around it, making it look even more low rent. To its credit, some of the chiptunes are actually decent and make the game tolerable. The best thing I can say is that the overall gameplay isn't terrible. Still leaps and bounds beyond Deep Blue, so it can actually be picked up and played once to see what's on offer and do some dodging. Just don't expect anything impressive along the way, and keep your expectations in check. Psychic Storm is a PC Engine exclusive developed by Alpha System, a company that released many other shooters for the console like Hiaidan, and what Psychic Storm does best is presentation. The backgrounds are super imaginative and the game is a cool mix of Cybercore and Kaiju inspired bosses. You get the usual Super CD intro, though it's nowhere near the level of the amazing sequence from Kiaidan. The soundtrack is also pretty well done, upbeat and fitting most of the stages in pace well. You choose between four different ships, each with their own transformation, along with being able to choose a new ship between each stage, adding to the variety. The downside is each has their own power level, so swapping from one in the late game that's well powered to another that you haven't used much isn't the best idea. The real deciding factor whether you enjoy this game or not is the difficulty, as it's really quite easy, one of the easiest on the console. It also lacks any type of scoring system, which is a bit unusual for a shooter. So between the easy difficulty and no scoring at all, the replayability can become limited. Of course, if you're a beginner and just want a fun and unique game to 1cc, Psychic Storm is definitely one to give a shot. Psycho Chaser was the first game ever developed by Sting for the PC Engine, also responsible for the excellent Override and glorious Tatsujin port that came after. It's one of the few ground-based shoot-'em-ups on the PC Engine, and it makes you wish there were more of them, as I personally love this style of game. One of its best features is how well it's optimized, meaning there's practically no slowdown to speak of. You have a set of weapons to cycle through, and you'll be doing it constantly to take out enemies from behind and to your sides, making the game more strategic than it looks. It's all about knowing the wave that's coming up next and having the right weapon selected to take them out as quickly as possible. The game starts out looking like a huge hitbox, hard to dodge, slow moving type of game, but that's definitely not the case. You very quickly power up and speed up, including assigning upgrades to your weapons at the end of each stage. The graphics are simple, but when a game is this unique and fun to play, and so well optimized, it's something I can forgive. It's still creative in its enemy designs and bosses, and fun to replay on a regular basis. And it really rewards you for progressing, as the stages and bosses only get more interesting the farther you get, along with a pretty cool soundtrack. Psycho Chaser is a game I can wholeheartedly recommend to any fan of shooters, especially those that enjoy the ground-based style of gameplay. Psychosis, or Paranoia in Japan, is an early and average Hukart shooter. Its main draw are the cool and psychedelic stages, enemies, and bosses befitting its name. And in that sense, while an early and basic game does a good job with the eye candy, what's most interesting is some of the censorship done to the US release, to sanitize what was otherwise intended as a commentary on mental illness, where you enter your own subconscious to battle against the demon that's taken control. The Japanese game opens with a pair of ants chasing down a caterpillar. And no, your eyes don't deceive you, freaking molesting it as it continues to try and run away. At the end of each stage, the demon basically flips you off and straight up says before the next stage begins. Clearly, all this was removed for the US release. 
Also, for whatever reason, they swapped stages 2 and 3, which is odd, as it makes the second stage harder than the third, as well as your ship being less powered up. But overall, Psychosis is a pretty creative and interesting game, along with some decent tunes, but wrapped in average and somewhat unbalanced shooter mechanics. But the ending is pretty messed up, with you thinking you're getting one, but nope! You didn't think it'd be that easy, did you? Silly rabbit. Go back and play the much harder second loop instead to try and see an ending. And if you think the first ending was messed up, and you'll somehow be rewarded for finally clearing it twice, be prepared for the biggest middle finger of all. So yeah, it's like that. There's no escape from this paranoia. R-Type, the granddaddy of strategic shooters in Irem's blockbuster classic. As far as I'm concerned, the original game is beyond review or critique. It's the prototype for so much that's come after, often imitated but never duplicated. But what I can review is the PC Engine port of the game, which was revolutionary for its time. The fact it was an early release on Hugh Card, Irem pulled off a miracle on the PC Engine closer to arcade in both look, sound, and gameplay than anyone imagined possible. It was a must-own game for every purchase of the console. I personally prefer the excellent chiptunes on the port over the arcade, and the difficulty, while still extremely high, was toned down just enough to make finally conquering this brutal game a reality. The port was so large that it originally had to be split into two Hue cards, with the final four stages on the second card, using a password from the first to continue on. The US release was a larger card that managed to combine them into a single game. Slowdown is nearly non-existent, keeping the gameplay fast and smooth, with lots of sprite flicker being the main offender when things become more than the system could handle. But until the much later PlayStation release of our types, this was the definitive way to play the game at home, and still holds up. Our type will always be one of the greatest of all time, and so will this port on the PC Engine. One good turn deserves another, and of course there had to be a CD version of our type titled Complete CD. The game is pretty much identical to the Hue card, only with a cool added opening cutscene, followed by a ton of cutscenes throughout, but more importantly a completely remixed soundtrack. Whether you like it more or not is a matter of preference, as I personally love and prefer the original chiptunes best, but otherwise it's the same great port. Given that a single Hue card version was never released in Japan, a single CD with the complete game made sense, though it would have been nice to have the option for the original or arcade chiptunes as well. Looking for a shooter where you play as a mechanical punching rabbit? Then Rabiolipa Special is for you. Though whether the game is truly special compared to the arcade original is debatable. It's a deceptively simple yet very difficult game, without any slowdown and extremely fast enemies and bullets. Some that will bum rush you with no warning. Looking at the pedigree of the developers that went on to program games at Psycho like Gunbird and Strikers, suddenly all the ultra fast bullets make sense. The arcade version was already hard, but the PC Engine version adds checkpoints, potentially making it even harder. You get a fast base shot, which doesn't upgrade, and a limited set of heat-seeking missiles that do, which you can replenish throughout levels by breaking and opening the carrot cans. Picking up a bow for your cute rabbit ears doubles your firepower, probably the most important power-up in the game. The other mechanic is your ultra-powerful rabbit punch, which happens automatically when you get up close and personal to point-blank enemies. It does a lot of damage, but given how fast the enemies move, it's also risky. 
The PC Engine version takes a hit in the graphics versus the arcade, and isn't nearly as interesting visually, but compensates slightly with some improved music, which was more grating than anything else in the original. Unfortunately, it's also very abridged compared to the arcade with stages removed and condensed, being on a hue card with limited memory and the last two stages are mostly just rehash boss battles. Not to say it's a bad game, it plays well and very fast, along with being really challenging, but it's definitely not all that special compared to the arcade. Original Raiden, possibly the most popular and sold shooter in the US arcades, loved for its cool visuals, explosions, and meaty sound effects, along with a fantastic soundtrack, yet hated for its absolutely brutal and punishing gameplay. Raiden both enthralled and infuriated most who gave it a go, and it was popular enough to be ported to nearly every console and computer in existence and the PC Engine port was definitely one of the better of its generation. Despite being the very first home port ever of the game, it stands out in its graphics work and fast gameplay, making it my personal favorite of the ports. Yes, it looks surprisingly better than the Mega Drive port, which released afterward. Problem is, it's not as arcade accurate in its game speed feeling like it plays even faster and crazier. Of course, that's what I like about it, but purists won't agree. The bullets are extremely fast, which isn't welcome given the shorter screen, but is compensated by a faster ship speed, which again, I absolutely love, as the slow ship speed is what always turned me off most on the early riding games. And since there's no two-player option, respawns don't exist. I mean, was this game already not hard enough? Yes, the chiptunes are well done, and while not being able to mimic the sound of the arcade board the way the Mega Drive did, it comes across melodic and in the spirit of the original compositions. Though the lack of respawns or checkpoints, along with its faster speed, make this port of Raiden absolutely brutal. But wait! Raiden got a second and improved port later called Super Raiden on Super CD, and right off the bat, they went ahead and fixed the crushing difficulty of the U-Cart port, slowing down the bullets and the number of them to reasonable levels, making it a lot more fun and accessible to most players. They then went ahead and upgraded the music with a CD arrange mix that many will find preferable to the somewhat weaker chiptunes of the U-Cart. In fact, if you always loved Raiden but felt it important, possible to get into because of its difficulty, Super Raiden is the game to try. It's the easier of the 16-bit ports while still being challenging. But add on two extra new long stages at the end of the game, which absolutely ramp up the difficulty for expert players, and you've got a pretty solid 16-bit port. Both are good, but this one will punish you less while maintaining the core experience of the original game. Zanber 2 has the notorious distinction of being considered the hardest shooter on the PC Engine. Just think about that. How hard is hard? The answer is Zanber 2. It has unlimited continues and still manages to be the hardest. I did a full preview for it in my top 5 hardest shooters on the PC Engine video, but in a nutshell, the main reason is your absolutely anemic pea shooter, which really doesn't get all that much better throughout the game, nor do many of your other weapons, nor your charge shot. You do get a pretty novel boost mechanic that shoots you around the screen at warp speed, but it's also purposefully hard to control, making it a risky maneuver to use too often. The unfortunate thing about Razanber 2 is that it's potentially a really good game that would be more fun to play if your ship wasn't so weak, and certain stages not so unpredictable or unfair. Stage 4 is where most 1ccs go to die, in a level where no shots are actually fired at you. Instead, Bouncing balls without any predictable direction ricochet through the openings, 
while snakes kamikaze into you from various directions. The music is the highlight, which is simply outstanding. bad, you'll never hear many of them past stage 4, which thankfully has a really good one to enjoy. It also has some incredibly creative stage designs, but are devious in their layout, requiring both strategy and adept dodging to clear. Too bad, you won't see most of them, at least not unless you're extremely persistent, beating your head against the wall until you get the right combination of both skill and luck to make it through. Ray Zanber 2 is all sorts of cool, hiding behind a wall of all sorts of hard. There's also a drunken title screen, where the voice sample sounds like the entire office staff just got back from a night of drinking, then all tried to pronounce the name of the game, but just slurred their way through it instead. <laughs> now that, anyone can enjoy. That last review scared the piss out of you. Worry not, as Ray Zanber 3 isn't nearly the brutal game of its predecessor. Quite the opposite, the developer clearly took note and made the follow up far more accessible. Aside from your boost, which remains intact, the new weapons are more varied, interesting, and powerful. And the actual enemies, bosses, and cavern walls are really well designed and detailed with some of the better sprite work on the system, which makes it even more painful to say that the game feels unfinished. Like they had something really good they were putting together, but had to rush it incomplete. For every gorgeous ship you battle in space, the background is simply black, devoid of any space or stars. For every cavern that looks amazing, you get other areas with nothing but empty space in between, and no parallax layers of any kind. Like it was almost there, but not quite. The music, while decent, also isn't in the same league as the awesome second game. The gameplay is finally there, at least for most players to actually be able to play and enjoy. But the rest of the experience is hit and miss. For every moment of cool, there's other moments of confounding sparsity. If you can overlook this, you can have a good time with what's an otherwise solid and beatable shooter. Personally, it just makes me want to go back and play Ray Zamber 2 again and enjoy both its graphical and musical brilliance. At least until I remember what I'm in for if I ever do. This is the face you'll be making after you've played this one. Because Rock On competes with Deep Blue as one of the worst games on the PC Engine. It's only better in that it seems to have good intentions and not simply slapped together and thrown out the door. It's got a text opening with an English translation so horribly mangled. It makes games like Zero Wing look like a work of fine literature. Only it's not nearly as funny. Seriously, stop trying to read it. It'll just give you a headache. I literally had to go back and research this game thoroughly, as it was certainly a one and done for me back then, and I hadn't played it since, nor do I plan to again. You'll notice how insanely fast your ship gets as you pick up more and more speed ups. Pretty amusing actually, until you randomly crash into something with that large hitbox. Almost as unplayable as Deep Blue, really. Why the game continues to give you hordes of speed ups everywhere to the point where they're practically unavoidable is beyond me. I mean, I love shooters where your ship is really fast, <laughs> but come on, are you a hummingbird? There's all kinds of odd and confounding gameplay and control issues here, but it's really not worth wasting much time on. The only redeeming quality really is the large variety of weapon pickups and uh, uh, no, that's about it.
The best thing you can say about it is, well, at least it's still better than Deep Blue. Otherwise, a hard pass. And I recommend you do the same. Saint Dragon is a really cool and unique arcade game developed by NMK, known for other good shooting games like Gunnail and Thunder Dragon. You're in fact a metallic dragon, with your hitbox being your head, and the rest of your body being invulnerable. The arcade game is a very difficult, but a really good time with creative stages, effects, and some really pumping music and sound effects. And while the PC Engine understandably takes a hit, compared to the arcade being a hue card game, it's disheartening how poor of a port it turned out to be. There's plenty of PC Engine ports that still looked great while downgraded, but Saint Dragon is just lazy. There's no parallax of any kind. And aside from the opening stage, it's a bit of a bore fest. Stage one actually fools you into thinking it's going to be really good, as if the devs put most of their time and budget into it, and the rest of the game got the scraps. Even the boss is a large, good-looking sprite that mimics the arcade well. But then, everything goes downhill. It's not that Saint Dragon is a bad game on PC Engine, but it's mostly disappointing. The sound is especially poor, with mostly grating music, only outdone by the even more grating sound effects that's borderline painful to put up with. Play the Arcade Archives version on either Switch or PS4 and enjoy it the way it was meant to be. Or just enjoy the first stage on PC Engine and shut it off, as this one is unfortunately mostly untapped potential. We're going to talk about some great arcade ports. Let's talk about Salamander instead. Ported as Life Force to the NES in the US with a host of changes, but also ported to the PC Engine in arcade accurate form by Konami themselves. And despite being a hue card, it's one damn fine port. Aside from some slowdown and flickering spots when things get busy, it's about as close to the original as it gets. The graphics are nearly identical, and I personally prefer the wonderfully melodic chiptunes of the PC Engine port to the arcade. With some stages like 4 being some of my favorite VGM of all time. missing the realistic voices of the arcade, which can be forgiven. It's not quite as difficult as the arcade either, but still plenty tough and perfect for a home conversion, along with implementing a checkpoint system. How much do I love Salamander? It's my second favorite game of the series after Gradius 2 Gopher. Despite being a spin-off, the alternating horizontal and vertical levels, my favorite soundtrack of the series. two-player co-op mode make it a total nostalgia trip whenever I pick up the game. You can play both the PC Engine port and near arcade port on the PC Engine Mini to see how incredibly close they are to each other. Beyond impressive for a Hue card game. Salamander isn't just one of the greatest Konami shooters of all time, but the PC Engine port is one of the greatest home conversions as well. Ginga Fouquet than Setsu Sapphire, or Galaxy Policewoman Legend Sapphire, or just Sapphire, is the technical showpiece of the PC Engine library.
one of the few games late in the console's life that used the arcade card, boosting the additional RAM available over the standard Super CD card. The same duo who created both Gate and Lords of Thunder took that extra RAM and went to work on what would blow minds, hang jaws, and display graphics and effects virtually unequaled that generation. One only needs to see the game in motion to see what I mean. With polygonal rotation, scaling, and effects that simply don't belong on a 16-bit console. The kicker is that it was all done with sprites, simply leveraging the massive amount of RAM on top to fake these effects to such a realistic degree. So we've established it's a graphical showcase. But what about the rest? Well, the music is also amazing. Again, done by T's music of Lords of Thunder fame. And while not on that level, I mean really, what else is on that level? It's absolutely top tier with super rockin' tracks. The only real letdown with Sapphire is the gameplay doesn't live up to the lofty heights of the presentation. Maybe it was the developer's lack of experience with vertical scrolling shooters, with most of their hits being horizontal. But whatever the case, it's not as fast and kinetic as their other outings. Of course, it's still quite good, decidedly above average and well put together, just not in the same league of the other best vertical shooters on the PC Engine. Sapphire is notorious for its ultra high selling price, over a thousand dollars as of this video, due to its late release and scarcity. But it can now be played easily on the PC Engine Mini, among other methods, and is totally worth checking out. It may no longer be impressive by today's standards, but during the 16-bit generation, seeing this game in motion was simply mind-blowing. Maybe it's just me, but I dig sidearms a lot more than many others do. There's something about the controlled, wild speed of the game, combined with some really great music that kept me coming back. It's an early arcade shooter by Capcom, and by no means perfect. In fact, outright brutal in most respects. And aside from losing the two-player mode, this PC Engine port is not only perfect, I mean really, truly perfect in terms of the port, but it's even better. For better, and for worse. For better in that the soundtrack I mentioned is stupendous. If you've heard the opening track of the arcade, you'll know it's pretty lame. The PC Engine fixes this by making it one of my favorite tracks on the console. just so damn good, it'll give you goosebumps. And the chiptunes maintain their excellence throughout. Now, for the worse. It's literally as hard as the arcade too. Mercilessly hard. You play in both directions, and you can power up into an even more powerful mech via a special icon where another ship flies in and docks with you, giving you an eight-way shot on top of your existing weapon. Sidearms has a lot of hidden power-ups that can be found by shooting secret areas, and they become pretty important, as every extra life and upgrade is huge with a game that'll so easily wipe the floor with you. I also really enjoy games that don't have stage separation, and just keep on going like a continuous experience, and Sidearms does that as well. I can't promise that you'll like it as I do, as many find it quite frustrating to get very far. But in terms of arcade perfect ports, Sidearms is near as good as it gets, and then some. There was also a CD version of the port released later called Sidearms Special, and it follows in the footsteps of the original port of being equally fantastic. Of course, it has to include a completely arranged remix of the soundtrack in CD quality, which to be honest, I personally like a lot less than the great chiptunes of the original. 
But other than that, this release is also known for a completely new Before Christ mode that changes up the gameplay in a variety of ways, from new enemy patterns and bosses, additional checkpoints, a revamped power-up system, and deeper scoring. It's not only an extended mode for fans of the original, but a new way to play for those that found the original too inaccessible. Having both versions on a single CD is excellent, making it another worthy port that was put together with care and adding longevity to the game. The PC Engine really did the Sidearms games proud. Sinistron, or Violent Soldier in Japan, was a PC Engine exclusive and a really interesting game that's often overlooked. You'll immediately notice the odd shape of your ship with a beak up front, which begins closed but allows you to open it to varying degrees as you power up, widening your shot but simultaneously exposing more of your hitbox. It's also, yet again, quite brutal. Just not at first. It starts off a pushover. The first two stages are a breeze and ramps a bit on three. It's stage four that suddenly lays into you with the asteroid field and only gets harder from there. The final stages are something else. With so much coming at you from various directions, you'll feel lucky to have made it through any of them. You do get unlimited continues and can start from a checkpoint or beginning of the level. The visual style is great and reminds me of Zeroing, with detailed backgrounds and creative organic enemies and bosses. Most of the time, you don't know what the heck it is, but it does look cool. The chiptunes are also typical PC Engine excellent. There are some differences between the versions, including the really violent and gory cover art. The Japanese cover has you blowing through a creature with its guts spilling in all directions, while the US cover is simply menacing and minimalistic. But aside from some altered checkpoint locations, adjusted boss patterns, and the easy difficulty completely removed, which means you're stuck playing it on normal only. It's generally the same game, but if you stick with it and take advantage of the unlimited continues, slowly learning the strategic R-type-like stages and mastering your invulnerable beak, you'll see it's one of the cooler shooters on the system. Is there really anyone out there that doesn't love Soldier Blade, or at least like Soldier Blade, considered one of the best shooters on the system, and without a doubt the best of the trilogy, it's the final, refined, magnum opus of the Soldier series. Play Soldier Blade is to know the meaning of excellence and execution. Everything about it is top tier. From the fast paced and precise control and gameplay, the great looking stages and artwork, and what's possibly the greatest collection of chiptunes on not only the PC Engine, but of the entire generation. <music> to say that the music is amazing is an understatement. It's freaking god tier. It's a game that you can play over and over again for decades, and I still do. The speed levels have been refined down to two. Every one of the three weapon choices are equivalent and necessary, and the bombing system that expends your power-ups in exchange for damage and survival feels like second nature. You now respawn at death, so the pacing of the game is never interrupted, and every stage is kinetic, with constant waves of new and interesting enemies that never get tiresome. Bosses of stages harass you as mid-bosses, then just fly off to be face down again at the end. Backgrounds change multiple times throughout stages providing variety. Even the difficulty is spot on, easy for even a novice to pick up and enjoy, but eventually becoming just the right level of hard in the latter half. 
And for those looking for an extra challenge, the hard mode is really well implemented. There's simply nothing about Soldier Blade that isn't amazingly well done. In my mind, it's the Musha of the PC Engine library. And it's so good, it has to be experienced. When arguably the best game on the system is a Hue card, you know it's something special. That also includes the awesome Caravan score attack mode, which is easy to finish but incredibly difficult to master, and one of the best put together of any caravans ever produced. Soldier Blade is just magic. It's lightning in a bottle that's rarely seen in any console generation. Where a short development window of just several months, programmed by a crack team of developers, somehow work magic and create one of the greatest vertical shooters of the generation. Soldier Blade is the ultimate caravan shooter, and it's not to be missed. Sega's classic on the PC Engine? The hell you say? Yep, despite the original Space Harrier never being ported to Sega's own Mega Drive, and as a very early Hue card release, it's actually really quite good. Space Harrier was already great in its simplicity, which was part of its popularity. No complex mechanics, just move and fire. A game that anyone can understand. While it can't look as good as Sega's arcade hardware, reproduce the voices as well, has smaller sprites, and runs at a lower frame rate. Anyone who's known and played the arcade game will immediately notice how well it otherwise plays. What the PC Engine did best was performance, making it the shooter platform of choice, and Space Harrier is an early showcase, playing blazing fast and without any slowdown to speak of, not even any real flicker or signs of the system struggling. The music is reproduced really well, with the classic tune sounding as melodic as ever. But for some odd reason, they made a hard game even harder, by removing any form of continues, making finishing the game for experts only. Space Harrier was most accurately reproduced this generation on the late Sega 32X, only running a bit slower at 30 FPS and dropping some frames when things get busy. And there are certainly better ways to play it today, with the PC Engine port looking dated by comparison. But at the time, a Space Harrier port that ran so smooth without a hint of slowdown was mighty impressive, and I'd actually rather play this original than the Mega Drive sequel Space Harrier 2 any day of the week because it nails the most important aspect, which is smooth, fast gameplay, and fun factor. And that's one thing PC Engine Space Harrier does well. Speaking of classics, here we have the OG of shooter lore, Space Invaders. So OG that it's even before my time, and I'm quite the old fart. Not to say I haven't played it, even in the arcade back then. I mean, who hasn't? This port includes two versions, one of the original 1978 cabinet, and a second plus version with updated graphics, sound, and new gameplay. And it's all well recreated, as it should be. It just simply doesn't have the same level of extras and reimagining as the excellent Galaga 88 shown earlier in the video where that game took the original formula and turned it into a fabulous new experience that even those who aren't fans of the OG Galaga could enjoy. The Plus version is definitely unique, so how much you enjoy it really comes down to how much you can't get enough of the OG Invaders, without almost any extra frills to spice it up. As if one port of Space Invaders wasn't enough, there was a second release, Space Invaders The Original Game, 
which features various versions of, you guessed it, the original game. A bunch of them. That includes versus modes to play against your friends, but it also includes anime girls. Yes, it throws in some actual original games, where you compete against a friend, Bubble Bobble style, making it more difficult for your opponent by playing well. It's an interesting take on the Invader's formula, and at least adds something new to the mix. You can also play the original with a bunch of these anime girl backgrounds cycling as you progress through the levels. Yes, lots and lots of Space Invaders with endless backgrounds of mostly anime girls. Believe it or not, this also released on the Super Nintendo, only without all the anime girls. <laughs> so clearly, we know which version is superior. When all else fails and you need something fresh, just add anime girls, only on PC Engine. After the amazing Blazing Lasers, it felt like a long wait until Compile's next game on the PC Engine. But as always, it was worth it, with the fantastic Spriggan. Now on CD in one of the most beautiful games on the console. You can't look at Spriggan and not wonder how exactly they pulled it off. On a regular CD game no less as this was prior to release of the Super CD with the extra RAM. But the Wizards at Compile did it again, with an overall easy, yet accomplished shooter to showcase the hardware. If you think it looks like a sequel to Musha, you're not alone, as the only reason it doesn't carry the Alesta name is due to copyright reasons. But aside from looking like Musha aesthetically, only a lot more colorful and fantasy thing, it plays like a different beast. The power-up system is quite complex, with colored orbs making up your arsenal, and the combination of them in your inventory deciding how your weapon behaves. While initially confusing, it becomes a lot of fun to experiment with combinations. Dropping a bomb removes the latest from its slot and powers you down, but the game makes no bones about giving you tons of these orbs, a big part of what makes completing Spriggan so forgiving. Even on a hard mode, it's not tough to complete, making it a great game for novices. The CD soundtrack is well done and has its moments, but honestly isn't on the level of the amazing chiptune work they did for Musha. But music aside, Spriggan is one fine piece of work, both beautiful to look at, extremely varied and creative, and controls like a dream, without much frustration of any kind throughout the experience. It was a prototype to a new direction Compile later took with games like Sorcerer Striker and Kingdom Grand Prix after forming Ryzen. And while not the best game of their incredible library, it is yet another must-play on the PC Engine. Aside from the name, there's nothing in common between this second Spriggan game and the original, despite also being developed by Compile. It's actually very unique and unlike any other game they'd released prior, along with being their first and only horizontal shooter. In Mark II, story is front and center, with some phenomenally well put together cutscenes, some of the best on the console. That extends into the game itself, for better and for worse as it's filled with story moments and dialogue as you play. So it's a hybrid of shooting and watching the story unfold, which means your mileage will vary greatly if you can read or speak Japanese. As of now, no translation exists. So the only way to get a more seamless shooting experience is to turn the in-game story off as an option, which is a good addition. Great cutscenes and story segments aside, Mark II is a pretty average side-scrolling shooter with some cool ideas. Compile's forte was with vertical scrollers, so it makes sense their first horizontal would be a learning experience. On a technical level, it's still the compile we know. Super fast gameplay, plenty of parallax, and not a hint of slowdown to be found. Well executed and cinematic, with allies flying in and out of the screen to assist in the battle. The music isn't my favorite of their work either and can often be obscured by the loud sound effects, kind of in the league of Robo Alesta, where the music was a bit hit and miss for me as well. But the options and gameplay in this one are deep and unique, with the ability to cycle through various weapons, each with their own limited loadout. As you progress through the game, you continue to upgrade your mech, 
like the Sabre for close combat and ability to block bullets. So it's not quite accurate for me to call it average, in the sense that it's a very unique game with lots of big ideas. It's only average in terms of the overall shooting experience, somewhat clunky in its execution. Some people really enjoy this game, but in the overall pantheon of great compile shooters, it's one that I often play the least. Star Parody or your Perosia per, per, Perosia? Ah, the heck with it. Star Parody is a fourth game in the Star Soldier series. Wait, hold on. I thought you said it was a trilogy. Okay, not quite a part of the main trilogy, but just that. A parody of the trilogy and its progenitor, Blazing Lasers. Just like Parodius is for the Gradius series. Aside from it being a very entry-level game in terms of difficulty, clearly made to get the younger generation playing some shooters and into the series. This game is outstanding from top to bottom with the same level of quality as the main games. It's colorful and beautiful, hilarious throughout. The control is spot on and a joy to play, and the music is some of the best in the series, now finally on CD. You can even play as a giant PC Engine or Bomberman with all the tiny details in each that you'd expect. Everything about Star Parody screams quality, and if you just crank the difficulty all the way up, even an experienced player can have a good time with it. It's as charming as any Parodius game, and that's saying quite a bit. If you've already played the games it parodies, then you'll get all the in-jokes and homages and enjoy it that much more. It has multiple endings depending on the difficulty you complete it with, along with a score attack mode that's as well done as the game itself. It's without a doubt one of the best shooters on the PC Engine, with its longevity only hampered by its low difficulty. But it's hard not to smile when you play through it the first time, just to enjoy the great tunes and all the love they put into parodying a fantastic series to end its run. Steam Hearts is infamous for only one thing, and it's not the gameplay. Known as the hentai shooter, it lives up to its name, decidedly average in all other ways. Not knowing Japanese means you won't understand whatever inappropriate banter is going on, nor the cutscenes until you wait long enough for a glimpse of some 16-bit perversion. You get to choose from two characters, Blow and Fala. Okay, you know what? <laughs> Simmer down in the peanut gallery, will ya? It's just a bad translation, don't get your hopes up. You get an energy bar instead of one-hit kills, and can actually select stages directly after you've reached them. The visuals are a mixed bag, starting really bland, but improving the farther you progress, though never becoming all that impressive. The soundtrack is the best aspect of the presentation, making for an overall decent experience. So it's not a bad shooter per se, just very average, but with lots of story and bits of hentai thrown in. No, I'm not gonna show it here, but I'm sure you can find it if you're creative. Steam Hearts was also released on Saturn and much improved in terms of graphics and gameplay. So if you're going to only play one version, that'd be the one to do it. As aside from the naughty bits to keep people talking, this one would have otherwise been long forgotten. Super Star Soldier was the very first in the Soldier Trilogy and is still considered by some as their favorite for the simple fact that it's awesome and difficult. As the very first game, it's not as streamlined as the late Soldier Blade, with extra speed levels you can select, and an array of weapons that vary from super effective to pretty useless. But what this game gets right is what all Soldier games do. Super Star Soldier is super fast, super fun, has super music, and it happens to also be super hard. Or at least the hardest of the series. But it doesn't start off that way, with the first three stages actually being a bit slow and easy, similar to the uneven early stages of Blazing Lasers. They did copy the formula after all, but once you get through the early training levels, you've got yourself a barn burner of a shooter. After upgrading any of your weapons three levels, you'll get a shield that'll absorb three hits. 
which is very helpful toward the latter segments of the game, because dying and trying to survive with nothing but a pea shooter in the harder sections and bosses will have you chain dying and quickly, and burning your hard earned extends. Taking a hit even with your shield will knock your power level down one, but grabbing another power up of the same color will replenish it. Of course, you get the 2 and 5 minute score attack modes, which were used in the Hudson Caravans, and true to the game, it's one of the hardest ones they made, but as usual, brilliantly designed. And for those who've played the old Famicom games like Starship Hector, they'll recognize some really awesome redone and familiar tunes in this mode. Super Star Soldier isn't far removed from the brilliance of Soldier Blade. Not surprising as it was developed by Kaneko, the company responsible for the great Aero Blasters and the amazing Nexer. It's one of my favorite games to replay on the PC Engine as well, and a must play for any fan of Compile and Caravan style shooters. Speaking of Compile, Sylphia is their very last shooter released for the PC Engine, and although not on the level of their most well-known classics, it is a cool and underrated game. It plays very much like compiled vertical shooters of old, in typical Compile fashion. It plays perfectly with nearly no slowdown, while pumping out some of the more impressive graphics the console's seen. Now with a fantasy mythology motif, giving the designers a lot to work with, and making for creative levels and bosses. The soundtrack is also quite good, again CD based, and if not my favorite of their work, still upbeat and catchy, targeted toward novices and a pretty easy clear for anyone experienced. But much like many of the later Compile games, at least for me personally, it feels like a little bit of the original magic is missing. With a core team of staff having already left to form Rising, it was during the tail end of Compile's best days. When games like Sylphia and Robo Alesta released, well made but missing what made games like Super Alesta, Musha, and Blazing Lasers so revered. It looks good, but nowhere near the beauty of Spriggan, which was a regular CD game versus Super CD for Sylphia. Those are some lofty games to live up to. It sells for huge prices online as of this video, in the several hundred dollar range. If you're looking for a good beginner shooter that's easy to get into, add Sylphia to your list as it's worth checking out. It may not be compile at its best, but it's still compile, and that almost always means quality. Hail the mighty Tatsujin, possibly the most hardcore and badass game to a planet ever made. God, do I love Tatsujin. It's my favorite Toa Plan game of all time, in a long list of great Toa Plan games. But it's so addicting to keep playing, you keep coming back for more punishment. And this PC Engine port of the arcade is no joke. From the opening stage, less than a minute in, it'll show you what's up. And what's up is your ass. Unlike the Mega Drive port, which has a very fair learning curve, slowly increasing in difficulty and giving you some confidence, the PC Engine port will hurt you from the outset. The difficulty starts high and remains high. So the good news is, if you can conquer the first couple stages, in time, you can slowly learn to conquer the rest. At least up until the final level where the difficulty spikes again. The problem with Tatsujin is that despite its unwillingness to compromise in any way, brutalizing you at the outset, it's so magical you just can't stop playing it. What really hits you about Tatsujin is the flow of the game and the music that makes it happen. The 
ship controls like a dream, horribly slow at first as punishment for death, but fast and smooth once powered up. The weapon system is simple yet effective, with the blue laser being one of the coolest damn things you'll ever see in a shooter. That skull bomb is now synonymous with the Toa Plan name. You're constantly thrown into gauntlets against mini bosses, which normally come in pairs or more, spraying the screen with ultra fast bullets, and an AI that seems to always know where you're going, leading your ship in a way that seems almost unfair. And it all happens to some of the most catchy, entrancing chiptunes of the generation. I also love how the game feels like one continuous stage and just never ends. One boss flowing into the next level, and so on, along with the music that transitions so nicely where it helps to get you into the zone and stay in that zone while playing. It's just a complete ball-busting package that I can't get enough of, and in terms of mimicking the difficulty in gameplay of the arcade, PC Engine port is unequal. I also did an in-depth of this game in my top 5 hardest PC Engine shooters video, as well as a full comparison video head-to-head -head against the also excellent Mega Drive port. So yeah, man do I love me some Tatsujin, and the PC Engine port is my personal favorite way to play it. Terracresta 2 was a PC Engine exclusive by Michibitsu. The original Terracresta was hugely popular in Japan, and the second in the series didn't quite live up to it, finding itself in that middle ground of solid but not overly impressive shooters. Getting lost among better games on the console, much like what the series is known for, you can create ship formations, actually being able to customize it at the start of the game. Picking up formation power-ups throughout the stage gives you access to formation attacks, which only increase in variety as you power up farther. Collecting enough formation icons also releases the now series staple of phoenixes, melting everything in their path. The graphics work is on the simple side, though it does implement some parallax layers, as well as a lot of motion in the background. Terra Cresta 2 is a long game, with slow moving stages and near a dozen of them was also on the easy side and good for more novice players, but not great when the game is so long and you've already completed it. The chiptunes are much more the star of the show, being really catchy all around. The main driving force really, along with the formation mechanic, to keep you going. So in the end, Terra Cresta 2 feels a bit less than the sum of its parts. Not just terraforming, but Sid Mead's terraforming. Because when Sid Mead, concept artist for classics like Blade Runner, Tron, Star Trek, Aliens, and more does the visual design for your game, the dude gets top billing. And in that regard, terraforming partially succeeds. A wide variety of worlds with unique artwork, enemies, and backgrounds await, never lacking in creativity or variety. It may not be the best technically executed graphics on the system, but they're certainly cool to look at, along with many layers of parallax or effects, without a hint of slowdown. Each planet is unique, along with its own indigenous life forms, making it unique to other shooters that recycle enemies across stages. Strangely enough, where terraforming falters visually is with most of the bosses, being either mundane or partially hidden below the screen, to where you're not seeing much of the actual design. But overall, it's certainly interesting in terms of visuals. The same can be said for the soundtrack, which is really quite good. Suitably epic and upbeat, with your typical sets of CD guitar riffs and orchestral accompaniment. It's well done and suits the game, 
It's the gameplay where terraforming is decidedly average, not offering much new or interesting to actually do, or that other games don't do much better. And what any of this has to do with terraforming exactly, I don't know. Nor is there really any story at the start or end of the game. Maybe you're going from planet to planet, committing genocide against all the alien life forms there, cleaning them out and making room for humans to terraform and colonize the planet. If so, I'd have imagined the process to be a bit more entertaining, as you'll spend most of the time navigating pretty mundane waves of enemies to a decidedly easy game. So in the end, it's more of a curiosity and an average shooter at best, with some cool designs and music to back it up. certainly worth checking out for the designs and music, but don't expect the gameplay to keep your attention for too long. Thunderblade, the other Sega classic port on the PC Engine, aside from Space Harry, and it's another case where it's surprisingly well done for the console, despite being nowhere near the arcade, as no console at the time came close to reproducing the scaling effects of Sega's arcade hardware. So instead of trying to copy it and do a terrible job, they simply worked with what they had and put together a well-playing rail shooter. It's certainly much better than the disaster that was Super Thunderblade on the Genesis, probably the worst launch game of the bunch. Conversely, just Thunderblade on PC Engine gets the job done. It starts out with the overhead section above buildings before switching over to the more Space Harrier-esque view for the duration of the first stage. And given the hardware, it was again impressive for the time, including gameplay that's fast, smooth, and without any slowdown. The big negative for me on this port is the sound and music, which just isn't all that great and could have been done so much better, as it was in Space Harrier, taking away from what was otherwise a competent early port. But purely on a technical level, somehow this PC Engine port did what Sega's own console didn't, at least at the time. I'm honestly no Thunderblade expert to say how close the gameplay mimicked the arcade, only that it was a lot more fun than Super Thunderblade. So give NEC Avenue credit for not one, but two nigh impossible ports on a PC Engine U card, and doing solid work with both. Again, there are much better ways to play this game now, but taken as a product of its time, it's another pretty impressive outing for the PC Engine. Back again to the weird and wonderful world of PC Engine, this time with Toilet Kids, a game that I actually went in depth with in my weirdest shmups ever video. And while it's not a game so bad it belongs in the literal toilet, it's certainly about as mundane as it gets outside of the premise. You wake up in the middle of the night to drop a deuce, and somehow end up getting shot into the air, and then trapped inside the toilet bowl of doom. Now you've got to take on all sorts of turd-flinging gorillas and poop-shooting deer in an odd, Indian-inspired world that's got a smell even worse than it looks. Graphics are very basic and backgrounds are mundane, though at least the enemies and bosses are creative, with flying wieners and golden turds galore. The music is also catchy, but nothing to really dump a stump over. It's a very simple game with a simple premise that'll give you a laugh or two while slopping bum slugs, but don't expect it to last long once you've squeezed out a turtle head and moved on to a better game. A very typical Xevia style set of mechanics, where you either destroy air targets or bomb them down below before they bust a grumpy in your direction. It's a lot more fun to make fun of than actually play. Kinda like taking the Browns to the Super Bowl. Toy Shop Boys may look about as mundane and simple as the last game, but it's actually far better and more interesting, even if the graphics are the most pedestrian aspect. You play as three boys, each with their own form of attack, either a typical forward shot, a boomerang, or a swinging sword that blocks bullets, but can only damage airborne enemies, and you constantly cycle through them while playing, almost like swapping weapons, and whichever one you're using moves up front, while the two behind can be used to absorb bullets. The gameplay is designed around the strategic mechanic, 
and forcing you to use all three in the right situations. Adding some nice strategy and variety to the gameplay. Add to that some really catchy tunes. And you end up with a pretty fun game aside from the colorful but mundane graphics. It does have some odd quirks, like being quite easy for the most part until you reach the last boss, which suddenly becomes really tough and drains your lives like crazy. But aside from that, it's really not bad at all, and an average but leisurely distraction for an evening. W Ring is a pretty underrated cue card game that, while not wholly inventive, pulls off what it does quite well. Aside from the main gimmick of the ring that circles your ship and helps to block bullets when powered up, it plays a lot like a Gradius game, and even sometimes looks like a Gradius game, as in this second stage, which very much reminds of the second stage in Gradius Gopher. But for everything it copies, it also has some cool design ideas of its own. One of my favorites is the following stage 3, with an impressive amount of effects going on, and these floating islands with waterfalls hanging in the sky. And if you're tempted to say that they copied Konami and Zezix there, Double Yuri actually predates it. So the question is, who copied who? Later on, you have a speed stage inspired by Gradius yet again, though it's pretty impressive how much movement occurs in the background while it's happening. This pretty much continues throughout, making W Ring a really impressive graphical package as a whole, impressive enough to make you wonder why many haven't heard of or played it. The same can be said for the music, which is uniformly excellent. Difficulty-wise, it is on the easy side and can be beaten on the first or second try by anyone experienced. An aspect that slightly detracts from the game is that its gimmick, the rotating rings, aren't always reliable or useful. It's honestly kind of hit and miss whether they'll always block a bullet or not. So instead of relying on them as a game mechanic, it ends up being kind of there and something that's cool when it works, but not something that you can rely on. So while the rings give you the impression of some complex mechanic, that's not the case, and W Ring is a pretty straightforward shooter, albeit a quite good and underrated one, that I do recommend anyone that hasn't tried it before do so, both presentation-wise and in gameplay. Got a lot going for it. I get that Xevious is a classic, and the progenitor to much that came afterward, but <laughs> another Xevious port? Well hold on there, because this port was done by Compile. What? So how much can you still do with the old ball and chain? Turns out, quite a bit. Yes, this port does include the arcade original, and about as perfect an arcade conversion as there would be for some time. But the real draw here is the Far Drought Saga mode. Something Compile also developed for the MSX2, only here it's also a different game and story mode. And while it does look like a slightly enhanced Xevious game, it actually plays like a mix of that and an early Alesta, along with a really great set of chiptunes that really transform the experience. Enemies come in hard and fast, and the rank climbs quickly, making this version become much more hectic. All the while, the rockin' music that almost seems too good for what's happening on screen keeps me more interested than I ever would be playing regular old Xevious. After a while, especially the bosses, can start to feel like you're playing a form of Xanax with how many fast bullets it starts launching in your direction. So while there's no getting around, you're still playing a pretty old looking game from the mid 1980s. Compiled it all they could to make it new, exciting, challenging, and wonderful sounding in which they succeeded. I don't play Xevious often, but when I do, it's most certainly this well done port by Compile.
Anyone who doesn't consider Veeg's tactical gladiator a shooter must be out of their mind, as if it isn't. I'd sure love to hear what genre they consider it instead. Despite being incredibly unique and strategic, it plays like a horizontal shooter down to the auto-scrolling screen. Sure, you spend most of the game sliding around on foot and jumping, only flying through later segments of the game. And your focus is on balancing both offensive and defensive strategies to protect that massive mech from taking hits, as dodging isn't really an option. Your goal is to either cancel incoming enemy attacks or kill them outright before they nail you. And while it's initially perplexing to wrap your brain around its mechanics, once you do, I personally found its gameplay pretty dang brilliant. In fact, I used to play it incessantly on my Turbo Express as a kid, which is what it takes to master, as it's also incredibly demanding. But every aspect of learning a shmup is here, especially memorizing incoming enemy patterns and speed killing them as they appear on the screen. Choosing your upgrades wisely as you progress is critical to success, as your survival depends on the ability to kill enemies quickly. The controls can be really cumbersome, and mastering your mech takes a good bit of patience. And your one single life to clear the entire game means starting over every time. The graphics and large sprites are nice and the music is good, but it's the gameplay and controls you'll either love or hate. I fall into the love category simply for playing it enough to have it mastered, making it fun to come back to and enjoy. But the road to getting there was long and arduous, and not one many will be willing to persevere through. And last, but certainly not least, Toa Plan's other horizontal shooter, Zero Wing, famous for its terrible home translation. Except, not here. That was on the Mega Drive PAL release. What you say? That's right, the Japanese-only release of Zero Wing on PC Engine had no such funny business. It was a CD game, which means it used completely remixed music as was often the case. And while it was well composed overall, this is one time where I prefer the original along with the awesome Mega Drive chiptunes, which are even better than the arcade. It's overall a faithful port, but with some downgraded graphics as expected. But the biggest difference is the downgraded difficulty, being quite a bit easier than both the arcade and Mega Drive port. Much like the Hellfire port, it feels like it starts on easy mode and only creates some challenge farther into the game. So while the graphics and music are decent, it's not as good as the Mega Drive port. It does try to throw in an extra boss at the very end, along with a handful of CD cutscenes that's unique to the port, but it doesn't change much overall. I did a really cool, in-depth comparison between the ports in a separate video, so if you're interested, check that out after this one. But suffice to say, it's still a solid port of a really good game, with an absolutely rockin' soundtrack, one of Toa Plan's best. And aside from the music, it mirrors the arcade with a lesser difficulty, just not as well done as the excellent Mega Drive port, done by Toa Plan themselves, which is the version I prefer to play. But wait, there's more! There were three special Hue cards released for the Hudson Caravan competitions. Limited cards not sold in stores. For Gunhead, Final Soldier, and Soldier Blade. The original Gunhead didn't have this mode included in the main game, so this special card was the only way to play the Caravan stages. On the other hand, both Final Soldier and Soldier Blade had it included in the main game, though the special Soldier Blade card also includes an easy mode that likewise limits your scoring potential. My experience with the Gunhead special mode is limited and one I'd like to explore more one day, but the two Soldier games, along with Superstar Soldier, are some of the best caravan modes ever produced, and a must try for anyone that's a fan of the special scoring modes. But wait, there's even more! Have you heard of the Pioneer Laser Active? The crazy expensive laser disc system that had both a Mega Drive and PC Engine module. That's right, not only could you play those games on it, but there were a couple exclusive Laserdisc rail shooters released for the PC Engine module as well. The Vajra series. And they were made by Data West, 
the developer behind the Razander games. The first game is mostly about managing the clock, as each stage is really just a boss battle, so it needs to be defeated before time runs out. And despite the rudimentary graphics, the game actually plays well, with a fast pace, making it easily replayable. In general, you either dig laserdisc type rail shooters or not, but Vajra was decent for what it was. Now the sequel was something special. Vajra 2's main difference is that instead of focusing on a boss per stage, you now fly through the entire level, taking out smaller enemies before confronting the boss at the end. In fact, portions of levels are on foot, feeling like you're piloting a mech, much more so than the first. You'll also notice the big jump in graphics work, looking a lot nicer than the first. The backgrounds actually have textures, and the bosses are far more impressive. Really impressive, actually. The music is also a strong point, with some really good tunes. This sequel was practically a tech demo for the LD-ROM, and while few will ever get to try it on real hardware, if the opportunity presents itself, don't hesitate with this one. Along with the Mega Drive module classics like Time Gal and Road Blasters. Vajra 2 is well worth checking out. The PC Engine had so much shooter love that even tons of non-shooting games just couldn't help throwing in special shooting levels as part of the gameplay. I don't mean the original Twinbee, like on Konami's Tokimeki Memorial, but shooting stages or bosses in games like Bravo Man, Ghost Man, Cross Wyber, Frey CD, Shadow of the Beast, Shapeshifter, Jim Power, and the really cool Shubibimon games. Developers just wanted to try their hand at making a shooter, and found creative ways to sneak them in and spice up the gameplay. Of course, the PC Engine wasn't a one-trick pony, with great games across all genres and hugely popular in Japan, with over 600 games in its library. If you ever wanted to learn more about what made it so fondly remembered today, I did a fantastic two-part series on its history in games which you can check out right here. The PC Engine was truly amazing, and its shooting library was one for the ages.